um, in, with us today. And I'm going to bring you up to the stage, Pastor Che, to take over from here. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. It's great to be back in Raleigh. I think it was around 10 years ago I was here at Catch the Fire Church. And Duncan, Pastor Duncan, Kate, and Murray, and all the leaders here, thank you for hosting us well. And let me introduce you to two of my uh, spiritual sons who are traveling with me. Uh, pastor Jay is an associate pastor at Harvest Rock Church, one of our campus uh, pastors. And Pastor Irwin pastors a great Hispanic African American church. And um, it's so great to have them with me, and it's just uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, let me just take a little poll here, a little survey. How many of you have never heard me speak before? Just raise your hand, wave at me. Okay, it would be like 90% of you, which is great because I could tell my old jokes and be brand new for you guys, and so that's, that's wonderful. I don't see a lot of Asians, but I want you to know, with uh, all the sensitivity to racial issues, I want to just tell you I'm Korean, and uh, as a Korean, I can tell the difference between a Chinese and Japanese, and a Korean. Can I give you a little cross-cultural lesson? So you can, I know you think we all look alike, but we can tell the difference, so. It's really, really simple. If you see a rich-looking Asian, they're Chinese. <laughs> By the way, their GDP, if, if we don't see a revival in our economy, will surpass us in 10 years. If you see a smart-looking Asian, they're Japanese. They'll take whatever we invent and make it better. But if you see a handsome looking Asian, he's Korean. So that's how you tell the difference between three different groups of people. So, Actually, my, my dad was the first Southern Baptist pastor, Korean Southern Baptist pastor in North America. We immigrated here in 1960 to Washington, D.C. And uh, I grew up in the East Coast. In fact, my brother went to Duke University. He's a surgeon. He's part of our church now in Los Angeles. And so uh, we have a lot of rich heritage. Uh, my uncle was professor at UNC. And so we have a lot of uh, history with uh, North Carolina. In fact, when I got busted for drugs before I gave my life to Jesus Christ, <laughs> my dad sent me to North Carolina thinking I could get away from my friends. But unfortunately, I hung out with college students at UNC and partied with them. And so that didn't really help me. But, but I'm here by the grace of God because even though my parents immigrated, uh, they left a very challenging situation. In 1960, Korea was considered the poorest nation in the world based on the UN stats. And that's because of the Korean War uh, from 50 to 53, and then before that, World War II, of course, devastated Korea. But in 1945, as Stalin and Truman were dividing up the allied nations, uh, they designated North Korea to be a communist nation and the southern part, South Korea, to be a democracy. Now, my dad was living in Pyongyang, what is now North Korea, and he was a pastor. And the moment they made that declaration of being a communist, atheistic nation, they arrested my dad, as well as many other Christians. It wasn't for General Douglas MacArthur pushing the North Korean forces up to the North Korean border. My dad would not have been out of jail. He escaped down to the south met my mom, and a few years later, he had me. And so I'm here by the grace of God and for the United States Armed Forces helping us to be delivered from the tyranny of communism to be here in, of course, Fort Bragg, and uh, the forces here are just uh, world-renowned. And so we came here having understood what communism is all about. And, um, I mean, literally, you talk about darkness. When you take a satellite photo of uh, Korea, uh, China's all lit up because it's on the Chinese border, Japan's all lit up, South Korea's all lit up, but in North Korea is absolutely dark at night because they're so impoverished they can't even afford electricity. And so we see how socialism has impacted nations like Korea, like North Korea, like Venezuela, like Cuba. But if I told you that two months ago I received a letter from our city prosecutors saying that if you continue to meet, because the church is locked down in California, we will arrest you as a pastor, put you in jail for one year, and we will find every church member up to $1,000 per person. And then here's the last thing they said, and we also have the right to, to arrest your church members and put them in jail for one year. Now, we're not talking about North Korea. We're not talking about communist China. 
We're not talking about the former Soviet Union. We're talking about the United States of America. And so what we're seeing happen in California, I believe, can happen throughout this country unless we put our spiritual foot down and believe God for revival and reformation in our nation. We're just going to see this left-wing socialism sweep the United States. Who would have ever thought? But from the very beginning of COVID-19, our governor, Governor Newsom, declared us as a church not essential. I mean, think about it. Marijuana dispensaries are essential because marijuana is legal in California. Abortion clinics are essential, but the church is not essential. So we sent a letter to him with 1,500 signatures of pastors in California. I wish we had gotten more, but we had at least 1,500. And we said, with all due respect, the church has been essential for 2,000 years. We are representing Jesus here on earth, and Jesus is the most essential being and deity in the universe. And so, uh, of course, he didn't even respond to us. He didn't even give us a reply, you know, just a, a form letter reply. We got nothing. And in fact, uh, right away, he locked down the church. And we mitigated because, uh, you know, the numbers were kind of scary, to say the least. Uh, Governor Newsom said out of 40 million in the state of California, 25 million would have COVID-19, 2 million would die just in California alone. And of course, we were hearing from President Trump that if we didn't mitigate, that we would have 1 to 2 million that would die in the United States, not just California, but in the whole state of the United States. And so we locked down on March the 15th, and this was really hard for pastors. How many pastors do we have here? Because of course, we had Easter coming up. For us, we had our anniversary service, April the 4th, 1994 is when our church started, Harvest Rock Church. And we had a major speaker coming in, Apostle Montanato from Miami. We're going to celebrate our anniversary service. And, and uh, we had to lock down. And we did it because we wanted to be good citizens. We wanted to comply with uh, the uh, edict from CDC and from our president himself. He asked for a 30-day 30 30 uh, lockdown. So we locked down. But then, I don't know if you remember, um, they were just saying, we need to flatten the curve. We can't inundate the hospitals with COVID patients. So my brother, who's a surgeon, uh, was told that he's a cancer surgeon, that he could not do any surgery for six months at least, that uh, we had to just make sure there was enough rooms for, uh, for COVID patients. And one of my other church members is a professor of medicine at USC, and um, she was assigned to Cedar sinai which is a hospital in Beverly Hills, to take the influx of COVID patients. And this is her testimony. She was there for six days and not one COVID patient. And she said, I'm wasting my time. I'm going to go back teaching at USC. And this is now end of March. And she, she went back. And so now I, I, I want to say this pandemic is real. It's very contagious. But we have learned so much. And so if we just quarantine the elderly, those with underlying condition, those with pre-existing condition, but open up the rest, I think we could have managed well. But we didn't in California. You won't believe what a blessing it was just to go out to a restaurant last night because to go into a restaurant, have in-person dining and being served inside a nice air-conditioned restaurant is a luxury. We still can't do that in California. It's been over eight months and the only restaurants that are open are outdoors if you, want to take, if you want to be outdoors in 100 degree weather with smoke that's just going to choke anyone because of the fires that are going on, then be my guest. But still, after eight months, we can't even meet for dinner. And by the way, there's a new edict out that those who are in outdoor restaurants, according to Newsom, this just came out last week, that you have to wear your mask in between bites. I am serious. This is, yeah, this is the micromanaging that's going on by our governor. So I don't know how you do it. I just take it down, take a bite, put your mask on, take what, whatever. It's so ridiculous. So when we didn't see the numbers, we, this is now in March, I mean in May now, um, uh, near uh, Mother's Day, and I was just feeling this, uh, really, this, this ream of this revelation coming to my heart that we need to meet for Pentecost Sunday. We miss Easter, we miss Palm Sunday, but we should gather on May 31st on Pentecost Sunday. So we made the decision that we we're going to open up. And, um, and so ironically, the governor allowed us to meet for like a month and a half. 
But during the time that we were allowed to meet, he said this, no singing or chanting. I didn't know where he got the chanting from. I guess they're Hare Krishnas in California, but he said no singing or chanting. And, uh, it, and this is so ridiculous because the Constitution, our First Amendment says that the state will not establish a religion, a state religion, nor interfere with the free exercise thereof. It's the first time an elected official is telling us how to worship. There is a separation, not that we're not to be involved and engaged in politics, but there's a separation where the state cannot be involved with the church. And for the first time, he's telling us how to worship. And then again, we said, with all due respect, we're gonna let the high praises of God be in our mouth. We're gonna war through our worship. And so we worshiped and we opened up on uh, uh, May 31st and we've been open ever since. And what happened was is that, um, what happened was is that uh, when he locked down for the second time after a month and a half of this window, and by the way, it was not only no singing or chanting, it had to be 100 people or less. And so he was managing all the large churches in California could not gather together. It wasn't really worth it for 100 and less. And so we didn't even comply with that. We said, we're going to open. We did encourage people, again, with underlying conditions to stay home. Uh, but we said, uh, if you're if you're able to come and worship with us. We didn't have children's ministry, so that took care of the parents, they stayed home. And so I would say 50% of our congregation came out on uh, May 31st, but we've been meeting. So when he locked down the second time, here's what happened. He said he was very specific, no Bible studies, no prayer meetings, you can't meet in home. If you actually go to another person's house to pray for someone with COVID, you're doing it illegally. And so now he's saying not just church services, no worship, period. Because one of the things that were, you know, uh, Rick Warren, for example, who's really into small groups, saying this is ideal for our small group ministry because we don't have to meet on Sundays, but we should just allow our small groups to flourish. He locked that down as well. It's unbelievable. And then meanwhile, the George Floyd tragedy takes place and our city is just rioting, protesting. I have a picture of 100,000 people in Hollywood marching shoulder to shoulder, no masks, no social distancing, and Governor Newsom gets on television the next day with a press conference and says, we want to just commend you. Your voices need to be heard. You need to exercise your First Amendment rights, and God bless you. These are actual quotes from Governor Newsom. But no, God bless you to the church. The hypocrisy, the duplicity of allowing the protest, and we agree with freedom of speech, as long as it's not violent. So yeah, they're exercising First Amendment rights, but what about our First Amendment rights? And at that point, something rose up within me. <laughs> it's like a righteous anger. You know, I feel the church has been like the, the Lamb of God. We've been so meek. But there's a, an aspect of Jesus that I feel that needs to come forth, and that's the line of Judah. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we just said, um, you know what, we're going to sue you. And so I contact my attorney, um, Matt Staver, with Liberty Council, because we had grounds, no singing, no chanting, no Bible studies, no prayer meetings. Plus, he's commending the protesters, so that dichotomy gave us the basis to say, this is discrimination, you're discriminating against the church. So we're in a lawsuit. And uh, pray for me, because we're now at the Ninth Circuit, we lost at the district court, it was a Obama appointee, and now we're before the Ninth Circuit, which is the most liberal circuit out of the 11 circuits in America. 70% of the Ninth Circuit's decision are overturned by the Supreme Court, to give you an idea how left they are. And so we're, at, at, there's 29 judges, but uh, uh, it's a lottery system, and they pick three out of 29, and you don't know who you're going to get. Most of them are Obama appointees and Clinton appointees. Now, the good news is that President Trump has now appointed seven federal judges to be on the Ninth Circuit, so we're, there's a chance that we'll get a <laughs> President Trump choice. And I think that's maybe one of the greatest achievements uh, by the end of this year will be 300 federal judges that have been appointed, including three Supreme Court justices to be confirmed, I believe, with, uh, with uh, Amy Barrett. Now, 
So pray for us, and, uh, but here's the point. Uh, there's only a handful of churches. You know, California has more evangelicals than any other state except for Texas. And yet only a handful of churches have opened up. And the Lord began to speak to me from 2 Timothy 1.7 that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Now what's really interesting about that word fear is not your normal Greek word, phobos, which we get the word phobia from. It's a very rare Greek word. It only appears two times in the New Testament. Once in this passage in 2 Timothy 1, but the other in Revelation 21. And it's the Greek word dylea. And let me give you the context of how that's used in Revelation 21, that when he, the final day, the great day of judgment before the Lord, he will throw murderers, adulterers, and then this word cower, cowards. It's the word cowardice. So it's not giving us the spirit of being a coward, but power, love, and a sound mind. I feel that the church has been moving in this kind of fear. Instead of being bold, the righteous are bold as the lion. They have been cowardly. And, uh, and so it's just only a handful of churches have stood up and said, we're opening up. One of them is John MacArthur. I mean, this is so amazing because John MacArthur has been criticizing us uh, as holding these strange fire conferences right down the road. There's a church. He's talking about us. And because we have these Revival Alliance conferences in Pasadena. He said that this is, and yet we're in the same boat together. How many you know God has a, a funny way of bringing his church together? And so, <laughs> so we're with uh, John MacArthur and... Uh, and then Jack Hibbs with uh, Chena Hills uh, Calvary Chapel. One of us will go to the Supreme Court. It may not be us. You don't ask to go. You have to be chosen. But there's three that are challenging the state of California for our constitutional right to meet as a church. And one of us will go to the Supreme Court. And with Baird being nominated, most likely will be a 6-3 majority. And so we're not worried about this. We're not worried about this. But I'm, all this to say that this election is the most consequential, the most important election of our lifetime. Because if the left wins, come on, our religious freedom will be taken away, big time. I was asked by my spiritual sons, I said, what, what happens if uh, the Democrats win? I just said, well, it's the beginning of the persecution of the church. We're experiencing a small microcosm of what's going to be on a macro level uh, because our, you know, in California, it's a one-party state. Even when people run for state assembly or state senate, there's two Democrats running. There's not even a Republican party. It's that they don't even make it to that final uh, election. And it's so sad because there's so many evangelicals in California that are qualified to run but I, I think, and people say, why, why? I think part of it is, uh, part of it is, is that we've gone so seeker sensitive that we've not become relevant in the church. Part of it is our eschatology. We're just thinking that everything's going to be, get worse and worse, and then Jesus will rapture us out of here. How many know Jesus asked us to occupy until he comes back? He asked us to disciple nations, not make disciples in nations, but disciple nations, which is a big difference. We're to bring about transformation. I'm not talking about theocracy. I'm not talking about uh, the dominion mandate or dominionism. I'm talking about being salt and light. The picture I have is that when you go to a buffet in, in the south here, you know, a southern buffet, you get your food, but you don't put salt on, in the corner of the plate. But that's the way the church is. We're just in one corner, just huddled together, doing our own thing, singing kumbaya. We're to spread the salt throughout the plate. We're to be the salt of the earth not just salting ourselves. And so we have to get out of the four walls of this building and we have to occupy, we have to be salt and light and we have to make a difference. Every one of you, you're in the marketplace, you're kings and priests. Revelation 1.6 says you're kings and priests. I like the way it says in uh, 1 Peter 2.9, you are a royal priesthood. Tell the person next to you, say you're one good looking priest. Go ahead and say that. <laughs> And so as I'm seeing all this unfold and I get the letter because we sued Governor Newsom since we've been meeting, I got the letter from the prosecutor, our city prosecutor. 
And by the way, I'm still here. I'm not arrested. <laughs> and I told my church, I said, you know what? In 41 years of being an ordained pastor, I've never had a sabbatical. So I'm looking forward to a sabbatical of a year. <laughs> I could study and pray, do what I want to do. My wife did not like that. She did not like that, but I was just joking, you know. But I, we're still here, and the reason why is we pushed back. We told our city, Pasadena, we have so much equity because we bought a performance arts building in uh, 2004. It's like the Kennedy Center. It's a $32 million building. It's unbelievable. It's a crown jewel. And we've used it to serve our city. For example, the police department uses it for free once a year uh, to give out their awards and, um, and to honor their police officers. And we said, of course, we would love to host you in our building. And so they use it. We have concerts. And each time there's a concert, we share the gospel. It's amazing how God's used that uh, building for his glory. And so we have a lot of equity. And one of the reasons why initially I was struggling with that we should open up is not because I was afraid of being arrested, but we had such good relationship with our city. I was wondering, is this going to undermine our relationship? We've been witnessing to them, loving on them, serving our city. But I felt like we need to be a witness of another time because the church needs to be strong. We are to be the head and not the tail. And we need to really have righteous convictions that we should not shy away from. These are biblical values. If we say love, we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, what does that look like practically? For me, Galatians 1.10 says this, if I'm trying to please men, then I'm not a servant of Christ. If I'm just trying to play uh, politics with our mayor, city council, uh, all the uh, people in our city, just to please and placate them, then I'm not being a servant of Jesus Christ. I was just saying, God, what's on your heart? And he was saying, I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth, not just online. We had online services years before we locked down. But it's like this. How many of you have ever seen a fireplace on television? It looks nice, it looks warm, cozy, but you don't feel any heat. <laughs> but when you're there, in the presence of God, the power of God, the manifestation of God, the kavod, the glory of God can come upon you in a very tangible way. I'm not saying it doesn't happen at home. It does, but it's more, more profusive because, why? Because it's the glory within you. It's Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when we come together, there's a synergy. And that's why in Hebrews 10.25 says, do not forsake the assembling of the saints, which some are in the habit of back then even, because of persecution. But all the more as you see the day drawing near. I mean, we're one day closer to the second coming than we were yesterday, amen? So as we see the Lord drawing near, we need to gather. There's over 51 others you cannot do at home. We can't pray for one another the way through laying of hands that we can do when we gather together. And so, but that's not the real reason why I'm here. So during this time of lockdown, and just seeing, my heart just broke over the whole George Floyd situation. I was involved in bringing reconciliation to the African-American and Korean community after the riots of 92 in Los Angeles. That's a long story. I don't have time to share that. But I just felt like the Lord speak to me when I was watching this, and, and now it's around uh, July going into August. I said, what can I do, Lord? And it was like this download came because the Lord gave me this and one of the confirmation is that you immediately see if someone else has this domain. Uh, but I got this one race for life download in July. Uh, the number one race for number four life. And the reason why is because we believe as Christians there's only one human race. We're made in the image and likeness of God, and Adam and Eve are our parents. Can I hear an amen? Am I speaking to the right Bible-believing group here, here in North Carolina? And so we're one race. And if anyone should demonstrate kind of love and racial reconciliation, it should be the church. And I'm not saying that there's not racism in the church. I'm just saying that, that we have the DNA of God. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within you and me. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
And so whatever systemic problem is out in society, we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, not loving our lives even unto death. Can I hear another amen? amen? And so we know we have the love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, Romans 5, 5. And so, and so I said, I would like to, we, we were having our global summit coming up, so I invited some of the top African-American pastors in America and Hispanic pastors to gather in Pasadena in August for the purpose of not only bringing the races together and being a Korean helps, right? So I'm able to bring the different diverse leaders in America. And then um, that, but I wanted all of them to be pro-life. And the reason why is because I, I, I didn't want to try to convince anyone to have a uh, pro-life or conservative position because we're looking for uh, leaders, African-American leaders who are conservative, who are pro-life. And so I called Bishop Harry Jackson because I grew up in Washington, D.C. He's been a friend for many years. He meets with President Trump all the time. And he said, I'll be there. He flew out just to be part of this roundtable. Sammy Rodriguez from uh, Sacramento, who is one of the major Hispanic leaders who also meets with the president. He flew out. A number of these key leaders came together. And I said, what if we formed a new movement because the truth is, is that we have gone pro-life fatigue, but I felt in my spirit, now this is before Ginsburg passed away or Barrett was nominated, I felt that we were this close to overturning Roe v. Wade. But I had received a prophetic word, and this is gonna stun you, but this is from Lou Engel. How many of you have heard of Lou Engel? Lou, Lou has been a prophet in my life for 35 years. He was my associate pastor, the founder of The Call. He got a prophetic word that the first wave of activists in the pro-life movement were the charismatic Catholics. And they're the ones who really went on the March for Life in 74 and on. The second wave was evangelical Christians like you here in this group. The third wave he heard from the Lord is gonna be African-American conservative, Hispanic conservative, black and Hispanic and Asian conservative leaders that's going to push this battle over to the other side. And it just made sense because God was highlighting the black community during the BLM and the whole uh, George Ford situation. But there's a redemptive. I believe in Genesis 50, 20, what the enemy is meant for evil of any kind of injustice, he turns around and works it out for the good, for his glory, for his kingdom. And so I threw out this idea. I said, what if we formed a new organization and no one had it, one race for life. And all of them, everyone who was there, including Lance Wallner, said, I'm on board. And they became board members of One Race for Life. And so I said, you know what? This could be a tremendous way of using this as a platform to go to the battleground states to encourage people to vote for pro-life candidates. Yeah. I don't even say Democrat or Republican because there are Democrats who are pro-life. But if you have a candidate who is pro-life, vote for that person. Because here's the reason why. When Roe v. Wade gets overturned, it goes to the state level. Each state has to determine. And so you have to vote for pro-life candidates on a district-by-district -district level, state assembly, state senate, and a governor that would be pro-life in order to see abortion illegal state-by-state. And so the Lord gave me this download and, and, uh, and also just recognizing my calendar, I had been already invited to do a conference in Detroit, which is in Michigan, a, a battleground state. And then I had been invited by Charles Stock to do a, a Sunday at, uh, in Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania. And so just trying to recognize and not organize, just recognizing what the Spirit of God was doing, I just felt like, and I talked to Sue, my wife, uh, we've been married 41 years, by the way, four adult children, three of them are pastors, they all love Jesus, that's the, the greatest legacy I have. And so I talked to them and I said, what if I was released by the church, Pastor Jay would take over preaching, I don't know what you're doing here, you should be back home preaching, but anyway. <laughs> um, but um, that I would um, go to Battleground State. So I went to, uh, with Pastor Irma, we went to Detroit first. As soon as I got there, the announcement was is that President Trump was coming to Detroit the next day, and sure enough, he came. From there, I went to Madison, Wisconsin, and the news came on that President Trump is coming to Madison, Wisconsin. Not Milwaukee, but Madison. Then I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and 
the announcement is that Trump's coming to Harrisburg, not to Philadelphia, not to Pittsburgh, to Harrisburg. And um, I was in Florida, and President Trump had just recovered from COVID, and the first place he's coming to is Florida. And then he was in Greensboro yesterday. I've been in Charlotte yesterday. President Trump is following me. I can't believe it. He's just <laughs> looking up my itinerary and just traveling wherever I'm going. It's been crazy. But I really believe in Psalm 37, 23, where the Bible says the steps of a righteous or good man or good woman are ordered by the Lord. And so we are just being obedient to the Lord, going to these battleground states, and it's almost like a John the Baptist type of ministry preparing the way for President Trump as he comes, and it's just been an incredible journey. And so we had a wonderful time. Uh, I don't know if ba Pastor Dexter Howard is here, but uh, he hosts said, Dexter, stand up. Uh, because he's one of my other sons, uh, HRM pastor, HRM pastor. Pastor Sam, also I see you out there, just stand up. And he was a, a Marine, former Marine police officer. Tremendous, both pastors now. And uh, it was just so encouraging to see majority of African-American pastors showing up at Charlotte yesterday. And uh, the downloads coming upon them and, uh, and they're, they're getting it, you know. And it's just a surge that I'm seeing happen in the African-American community and the Hispanic community. I think we're gonna be shocked at how many of them are gonna vote for life and biblically this coming election. I think we're gonna be shocked. <laughs> and so why, why the abortion? Why focus on that? Because you said there's so many other issues. You know, I'm an immigrant, so there's the issue of immigration, immigration, uh, the issue of the poor. I want to submit something to you. There are 631 laws in the Old Testament. A lot of laws. Most of them are ceremonial laws. But they've been reduced to 10, called the Ten Commandments. These are the top 10 on God's heart. Not one of them about the poor, not one of them about immigration, even though that's on my heart. But he does say the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not murder. Not kill, but murder. He does say you should not commit adultery, which... Of course, really, it's a rude issue to abortion because of, is the, we had the sexual revolution of the 60s, which caused for us to have abortion on demand in the 70s and legalize abortion in 73 with Roe v. Wade. It's absolutely immorality, irresponsibility. Now, I want to just pause for a moment and just say I am not here to condemn anyone who had, who's had abortion. When I was 16, my girlfriend got pregnant and I supported her to get an abortion. How I many you know there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin? But we also know throughout history, it was through legislation that the abomination of slave trade and slavery was abolished in Great Britain. 1807 through Wilberforce, the Slave Trade Act ended slave trade, and then 1833, almost 100 years after the Great Awakening began in 1738, that they contended to see slavery ended. And through revival and reformation, I'll be talking more about this uh, tomorrow at, um, or Sunday at Catch the Fire Church on, on Sunday morning, but how revival transformed society. And, and so I realized that we need you know, I mean, thank God for crisis pregnancy centers. Thank God for those who may be marching on and praying. We've been having the call prayer movement uh, that I've been part of since 2000, 20 years ago. And two things we did at that uh, first call, by the way, the largest youth prayer gathering in the history of America, 500,000 by one o'clock in the afternoon. We, made, we asked the young people to make two commitments, to pray for the end of abortion Roe v. Wade would be overturned. But number two, to never vote for a pro-abortion candidate. Vote pro-life. Now, we didn't ask them to sign anything, which is going to be different, because I'm going to ask you to sign something if the Lord leads you. And, um, and they all made a commitment. Something happened in 2000, because the census is taken every 10 years, and the 2000 census, only 38% of Americans were pro-life, very small percentage. Just before I started One Race for Life, I went online, looked up Gallup Poll's most recent survey, and for those who are 30 years old and over, which is including the millennials, okay, 
because millennials technically are 40 and over now. But 30 and over, so we're talking about part of Generation Z, 51% of Americans are now pro-life. Can we thank God for that? I mean, there's a huge shift. Something has happened in this country. And so I do thank God for the prayer movement. I thank God for the prayer movement, and I thank God for um, the uh, pledges that we called the young people because we did seven stadium events on my watch alone, and the smallest one was 35,000, so I know that that had an impact. But still, people have vacillated over voting for a candidate who's pro-life. And so what I felt like the Lord asked me to do is to go to the battleground state, meet with pastors, and we've had a tremendous response. We had 120 pastors in, in, um, in Florida, near Orlando, and which was like two, two, uh, just two weeks notice. We had 120 show up in Lansing. Uh, we had 120 show up in Harrisburg. The pastoral response has been amazing. And and for them uh, to make that commitment to vote for people who are pro-life and encourage their people to vote for pro-life. Why? Why is this so much on my heart for our nation? Well, first of all, we're made in the image and likeness of God. Psalm 139 talks about how fearfully and wonderfully made we are. I think of Psalm 8, for example, when the psalmist says, when I think of the heavens, the work of your fingers, the star, the moon, which your hands have made, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man, you would visit him, and yet you made him a little lower than Elohim. The King James Version says a little bit lower than the angels, but that Hebrew word is, is God. We're a little bit under God. The created order is God. We're, we're going to be judging angels as God, then us, then the angelic world. We are so sacred to God that when God came to save man, he became a man. Yes, he humbled himself. Yes, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Yes, he became a bond servant, but he became a man to die for your sins and my sins and rose again on the third day. So therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name of every name. That's the name of Jesus. And by the way, I will never bow to any other organization, BLM, or bow during the national flag. The only person I'm gonna bow to is Jesus Christ. And as believers, we should have that kind of commitment in our hearts as well. Because the whole city bowed, including our mayor, to BLM, you know, in one of the protests, marches. And I'm just saying, what is going on? This has become a religion. Socialism, Marxism is a religion. It's an ideology, but it can become a religion. An atheistic one, where man it becomes God. It's just like... You know, if you eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God. So we're going all the way back to the garden of that temptation of pride coming into uh, one's heart. And so as I began to share, I said, but there's something else at stake. It's not just, it's not just shedding of blood, but innocent blood and the doctrine behind that. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven which is an abomination. Now, those are strong words, hate, abomination. But in verse 17, he says, hands that shed innocent blood. There's six things the Lord hates, seven, which is an abomination. One of them is hands that shed innocent blood. You can't get more innocent than a life in the womb. All lives are sacred, including the unborn. They have human rights too. Can I hear an amen? And here's what God says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. If you shed man's blood and there's no consequences, there's not uh, a, a justice for that life taken, then man's blood, you, your life will be shed. And he goes on to say there will be a curse, a repercussion for, for the shedding of blood that if there's no retribution for that. I think President Lincoln understood that. Because in his second inaugural address, we just came back from Washington, D.C., we had this incredible thing called The Return. I don't know if you saw that, but we were also part of, the, uh, part of Franklin Graham's uh, march, uh, prayer march, and we ended up at the Lincoln Memorial. And I've been there so many times because I grew up in Washington, D.C., we'd take our kids down there. And uh, as you walk into the Lincoln Memorial, if you've never been there, you need to go there. And so you see the huge statue of Abraham Lincoln seated. And then on the left-hand side, you see the Gettysburg Address etched in marble. And then on the right-hand side is the 
second inaugural address, which he gave in March of 1865, a month before he was assassinated while the war was still going on. And he had an understanding, he's quoting scripture throughout his second inaugural address, and he quotes from Psalm 19.6. He says, <clears throat> fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war will come to a speedy end. But if God allows it to continue, then he goes on to say, until every drop from the lash is paid for by another drawn by the sword, then what was said 3,000 years ago must be said again. The judgments of God are true and righteous altogether. What was he saying? He was saying the 650,000 soldiers that died in the Civil War was the retribution for the injustice of slavery and lynching and lashes and the blood drawn by the injustice of slavery. So what do you do with 60 million babies that have been murdered since 1973? What does that look like for our nation? And I want to submit to you, I believe that abortion is the number one injustice issue of our generation, and, and abortion is the modern-day slavery issue for us. And if you were in love with Jesus, you would be an abolitionist. You wouldn't rationalize slavery back in the 1800s. If you were in love with Jesus, you would say, this is wrong, and you would speak out against slavery. We all take it for granted today, but I'm just saying if you were there, because there were many Bible-believing people in the South who rationalized slavery. Just like there's so many Bible-believing who rationalized abortion. It's so complex, you don't understand. What about rape and all this and all the excuses? But if you love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you're going to love what's on his heart, and you're going to hate what is on his heart. And he says, I hate the shedding of innocent blood is an abomination to me. So I'm going to appeal to your faith in Christ. I came intentionally not to go to the secular world, but to believers who love Jesus and to say, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Matthew 22, 37. But I'm going to ask you to make a commitment from this point on to lead by example to never vote for someone who's pro-abortion, to vote pro-life in perpetuity, because I believe that we're gonna see this battle for a number of years to come. It's not just what's happening on the courts with the Supreme Court, that's just the beginning. Conversely, I wanna say strongly, if you vote for someone who's pro-abortion, I believe that you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, Paul talks about the judgment seat of Christ several times, and the most well-known is 2 Corinthians 5.10. And that is not whether we go to heaven or not. We're going to heaven, okay? It's a different word for judgment. It's a Greek word, bema, which means the coronation of uh, the crown when you win the Olympics. It's, a, it's more of a reward as setting, that you're going to get rewarded. In fact, the Bible talks about that he's going to give us crowns, and we're going to lay it right back at his feet. But in 2 Corinthians 5, he says that you will be paid for every good and bad things that you've done in life. Every good thing, just the act of love and kindness, giving a prophet a cup of water, God says your reward, you're going to be rewarded for that. How many know God knows all things and he's noticing what we do? Absolutely. But he also says, I'm going to notice the bad things. And if you vote pro-life, you will have to give an account. And so I'm going to appeal to you again as Bible-believing Christians to have the conviction to say, I will make a pledge today by the grace of God that I will vote life in perpetuity until abortion is illegal and rare in America. So here's, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Do we have these cards that we passed out? If the ushers could pass these cards out. There are five pledges here. And they come out of this book, by the way, uh, Reformist Pledge, which I wrote in 2020. Lance Wall now has a chapter in this. It's probably the be best distilled essence of the Seven Mountain Mandate. He hasn't even written a book about it, but he did a chapter for me. And it's just fantastic. But Lou Engel did a chapter on life. Heidi Baker, Bill Johnson, Peter Wagner, Cindy Jacobs, James Gall, they all did a chapter. In fact, James Gall in January had surgery. This is before COVID hit. He had surgery for a sciatic nerve problem. And while was, he was in bed, Jesus came up to him holding this book. This is just this year. And 
the Lord said to him, this is the book of the hour. And he immediately called me. I said, James, I mean, that's 10 years old. I, I didn't know how this would be relevant in 2020 until we started One Race for Life. I said, oh my goodness. I'm asking people to make a pledge. It's called the Reformers Pledge. It is the book of the hour. Not because he wrote it, but because God is behind this in so many ways. This is on his heart. And so I want to encourage you. By the way, this is free. But we do ask you to make a donation to One Race for Life. Whatever the Lord leaves on your heart. Uh, suggest a donation. It's $20 if you could just cover the cost. But again, if you want it, you pick it up. And if you want to give a donation, because it's costing us as we're mobilizing these battleground states. And um, anyway, so appreciate that. But I want, to, I want to pray. Would you stand with me? And we're going to have Lance come on up and give him the rest of the hour. This is the uh, one-two punch. Lance is part of our apostolic team uh, for Harvest International Ministry. And he is a prophet. He's a brilliant prophet. And um, he's, you know, he's the one who got the download that Trump was going to be president in 2015. He also said that he got the word that Harris would be running for president. And uh, when she dropped out of the primaries, he said, oh, I missed it. But now she really is the de facto person running um, for president. That's a long story in itself, but it's just it's amazing. So Ephesians 2.20, the church is found upon apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. But here's what I want to ask you to do. Would you be kind enough to pray this prayer with me? It'll be a prayer of just loving God with all your heart, and that you will vote pro-life. Will you do this prayer with me? So I'm going to pray this, and I want you to be in agreement with, with me. Father, we just say thank you, Lord. We love because you first loved us. Lord, I, I just thank you that in 1973, I walked out of a Deep Purple concert to follow you. You delivered me from drug addiction in one day, and I've been running hard after you ever since, 47 years. And Lord, out of this heart of love, we just say our lives are yours. We love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We confess that Jesus is our Lord. And by your grace, we're going to obey you and follow you. And by your grace, we're going to vote life in perpetuity from this day forth. And let me just make a little pause here and just say, if there's two candidates that are pro-abortion, I, I don't vote. I just cannot stand before the Lord said I voted for a guy that, or a gal who was pro-abortion. I don't want to be complicit in murder. And so, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this solemn assembly that you are now um, calling the church to awaken. This is part of revival that you're bringing about in this nation. We thank you so much. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I'm going to ask you to, I think we're going to receive an offering, so make sure you, it's perforated, so just cut it out and put it in the offering basket when it goes around later on, okay? Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Pastor Che. What an awesome word, and again, do you feel the conviction and the call to actually this important time in our nation, right? Well, we've got the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Lance Walno to come up now. Uh, for those of you who may not know about Lance, a lot of you do, you probably heard about the seven mountains, the different mo mountains in the, both the, the church is the largest mountain, but with, under that there's seven. There's government, there's education, there's family, and the others that round that out. Lance um, got that uh, revelation several years ago. He'll probably tell you a little bit about that. And then in right before the election, in 20, coming in 2015, 2016, he'll talk about likely, uh, he wrote a book called God's Chaos Candidate, when no one was actually talking about this and what was gonna be taking place. And he now has, he's gonna shift and share with us today, I think, Lance, about what's going on today and how does it link prophetically. You can see today in the Word of God for America. Um, and so Lance, let me just bring you on up. Please welcome Lance to the stage. Thank you all for coming out today. Sure. On this late notice, how many of you uh, got the word just uh, recently about this meeting? That's the way we like it. 
Stay one step ahead of all the uh, protesters. <laughs> Disadvantages, nobody knows about the meetings. It's always a trade-off. But the, uh, I was always a big believer in spontaneity. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, I mean, you should be, I have the weirdest call. I just came to peace with it, maybe just recently. I realized that uh, you ever felt like, you, like, like you, you love everything that's going on in the body of Christ, but you don't always feel like you fit? Because like I was with something like this beautiful church, Catch the Fire, thank you, Pastor Duncan, for letting us be here and have, have this place to meet. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be able to do it. And I was at the conception, uh, inception, conception of uh, the Toronto movement. I was on Randy Clark's board. I was there when Bill Johnson just showed up, Heidi Baker. And I was an advisor, a consultant. And I was, I was a consultant to a church where the pastor left. I ended up pastoring the church. It's a heck of a way to get called into ministry. But um, I, uh, I, I always approached the, the calling of God as if God was about to do something phenomenal in my lifetime and that I know the trend in the church is to be uh, looking in this direction and God shows up in a way you don't expect, right? So for that reason, I was really interested in what was happening with Toronto, what was happening with Rodney Howard Brown, uh, what was happening anywhere where there was a supernatural. But at the same time, while I was uh, there on the whole thing, just when that revival started, just when the, uh, and I was there, I mean, I spent time, I, we, had, we hosted revival, we, I loved it. I, for some reason, at that time, fell into this thing about seven mountains. I ran into Lauren Cunningham. And I talked to him, and, and Lawrence said to me, his son was making a film, and he was really distressed because he wanted to be a producer, a director, a Hollywood guy, but he comes from a gener and multiple generations of missionaries in the Cunningham family. He said, but man, my son wants to do movies. He said, but I was teaching for years about the seven mind molders of culture. And so I said, that for some reason just went off in me. And I said, well, I'm loving revival, I'm loving deliverance ministry, we need to get back into that. I'm loving the prophetic. I said, what, what, tell me about the seven, seven, the mind molders of culture. And then he proceeds to tell me firsthand. And I couldn't get out of my spirit. Now you'll know you got something from God. That's how my staff knows there's a God thing happening. Because I get a lot of ideas. If I keep coming back to a certain idea, they know it's the Holy Spirit. Because I get ideas and then I move on. But you know, they, they kind of like don't get traumatized anymore because I get these big <laughs> ideas. And I think we're going to go down to Washington DC. We're going to take over the mall. We're going to meet the resistance. We're going to. But that idea kept coming back to me, so we're doing that one. By the way, October 31st, you don't want to miss this. It's another one of those spontaneous God appointments, but you show up, and, and I believe there's going to be an angelic army there. The, uh, on Halloween, October 31st, four or five days before the election, there's going to be the, the high holy day of satanic holidays. There's going to be all kinds of nefarious bad activity going on. But it happens to also be Reformation Day. It's the day that Martin Luther nailed the uh, 95 Thesis to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. And so it's ironically, it's the day God starts to shake up the religious order to take on the occult that is shaping nations. So we will have a meeting on that day. It's gonna be Reformation meets, the, uh, meets the, uh, the counterfeit revolution. And it's on the Washington Mall, right where the, the return was. We got the same location. It hasn't been easy, trust me. But we got it. And it's for prophetic worship, proclamation, preaching, and prayer. And uh, we, we started off, I, was just, I had the Trump Hotel booked out, sold out. I mean, like within 48 hours on Pentecost, on that day. I just put an announcement, out, boom. And, but then the mayor shut down the ability to meet in the Trump Hotel. But I, I said, well, Lord, I know you want us to go to Washington. And it has to be four days before the election because the return and all that stuff, the marching with Franklin Graham, I did that. But it's like, this is where you've got to push the battle through. Christians quit too soon. We've got to be there, bam, right there, those three or four days ahead of time. So uh, we, just, we just, by faith, went out. By faith, uh, we haven't even done fundraising. And this is like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars I'm putting into this thing, all because the Lord said, "Well, it's going to be a big seed. You're going to be planting." I said, "Amen." And then I found out what the big seed was for me it would be like three or four hundred thousand dollars, and we haven't even asked for money to this day. That's how confident I am that what we're doing is actually an initiative the Holy Spirit's doing. So we're going to go there, and Apostle Pastor Che, you're going to be joining us on the first night. Which will be we have a banquet. We're going to have a banquet. 
that, that part we were able to pull off. And you're, you'll be there for that speaking. And so I think it's perfect because it's Reformation Day. You've got the Reformers Pledge and I, the Reformation anointing is upon you, my friend. The Reformation anointing is upon you. Yeah. All right, so the fitting in the move of God is a problem. So I'm talking to Lauren Cunningham, and then he tells me the seven mind molds of culture. And, and this is fascinating to me. I just can't get this out of my head. But you see, I got saved off of Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ. I was on a military academy campus. My dad sent me there to get me away from girls and theater. And so he said, I got to get you away from, including my mother. He said, your mother interferes with discipline. My dad was a cigar smoke and hard charge, a World War II vet, uh, lawyer, businessman, vice president of an oil company. And he thought, I was a bit of a disappointment to him because he obviously he wanted me to be an engineer or a lawyer and I, I was more drawn to the creative arts. And so I love theater and I love girls. So he sent me away. Um, sent me away for three years to a military institution. They shave your head and haze you and harass you. It's like, um, I don't know, it's kind of like Lord of the Flies meets, uh, you know, prison. And so, so I was there, and I was desperate, and I wanted to get out of that place, but I had no place to go. Middle of the winter, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, I'm praying, and I'm praying, oh God, if there's a God, send, send yourself to me, reveal yourself to me. I was actually looking for an extraterrestrial experience. I thought, God, if there's a God, reveal yourself to me, and I honestly thought some other planet maybe might be picking up on this, because I grew up, my mother was Catholic, I love the Catholic Church, but it was like smells and bells and incense and rituals, but I just wasn't getting it. And then my dad, who I found out was Jewish, actually masquerading as an Episcopalian. So I was in the Episcopal Church. We had some terrible pastor who, God bless him, I got to meet him later on. He, he got better, he got filled with the Holy Spirit. His sermons weren't any better, but there was more life in him. And, uh, the, uh, and he just didn't have a revelation. And he was always beating up on my dad, he was a rich man. He was always doing sermons about the Bible and the rich people. And it was like the worst possible combination. Because my dad was a businessman in the community. He's talking about how the rich people don't enter the kingdom. And my dad's like, oh, yeah. Anyway, so, so, the, uh, so as it's going on, I'm, uh, I, I'm sitting there with Lauren Cunningham and I'm thinking, these seven mind molds of culture, there's something about this. And when the revival hits with Toronto, when the revival hits with, even with Lakeland, when the revival's going on, I became aware that I actually have a prophetic anointing. Now, from my dad's side, I'm a Levite. I didn't find that out. I'm an Ashkenazi Jew on my dad's side. Well, I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal, tongue-talking Levite. So, and there's nobody more annoying than a New York Jew. I am that. So I was born in Oyster Bay, Long Island, and suddenly my life starts making sense. Oh my gosh, no wonder I'm so offensive all the time. So, so the, uh, so I'm back with Lauren, and, and he says to me, do you know Bill Bright has the same revelation? He said, so he said, I got this revelation. The Lord told me that if you could, you disciple these seven, these seven spheres mold nations. If you can actually influence these seven, seven mind molders of culture, you could disciple whole nations. And, and the Lord gives me this download, and he's fasting and praying, and he's out in Colorado on a tent seeking the Lord. And, uh, and Bill Bright, meanwhile, has this revelation of world kingdoms. And the Lord shows him seven world kingdoms. And he says to him, whoever can occupy these seven world kingdoms will have the harvest of nations. The two of these guys, one fundamentalist, the other charismatic or Pentecostal. And they just didn't talk to each other because the fundamentalists thought the, thought the tongue-talking people were crazy. And the tongue-talkers thought the fighting fundamentalists were offensive. And so the, uh, but they had something in common, something which only in the wisdom of God could possibly bring them together. It wasn't the spirit of unity, it was a donor. The guy that was funding both ministries said, why don't you guys ever talk? I love business people. Do you realize how important business people are to the move of God? Do you realize the reformation that is happening in America is because God put a businessman in the government mountain? That's what he did. That's what he did. He went over here. He said, you know, this thing isn't working out. Let's grab somebody from outside. Send him in. It's like sending David up against Goliath. Saul goes, here's a sword, here's how you do it. I'm not gonna do it, but you should do it this way. If you're gonna do it, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. And David goes, I, uh, and so he says, you know what, I'm, I'm, from the, I'm a small business guy, I'm a small business family, I'll work with uh, something more familiar. Slingshots are what you use when you're working the backside of a, you know, a, a sheepfold for dad's business. So slingshot, I'm gonna, he brought an innovation into the situation. 
but I don't want to go down that rabbit trail. So I'm sitting there saying to, to Lauren Cunningham, so he shows me a movie, by the way. He shows me the movie his son did. And he's still perplexed. He said, my son's called. He said, it never occurred to me that the seven miles of culture are mission fields. Because Youth with a Mission is all about talking about these, uh, you know, seven miles of culture. But in reality, they're wedded to a certain methodology. And it's mostly church-related, religious-related, mission-related, and going into the systems. It's not really as ambitious. I'm not knocking. I'm just saying that, you know, you carry the ball as far as you can, but your essential DNA still dominates. Same thing with Bill Bright. Campus Crusade, he gets the revelation of seven world kingdoms. Well, the donor makes them get together, and here's how Lauren Cunningham finds out. He's out in the, on, on seeking the Lord in a tent and doing his own private retreat. The Lord gives him this revelation of seven miles of culture, and a, a mounted police shows up on a horse, and he comes to his tent, and he hands him an envelope, and the envelope is a letter from the donor telling him where the location of a restaurant is that he's to meet Bill Bright for lunch, and he set it up. And so he knew where Lauren was, so he tracks him down, he tracks down Bill Bright, finds that they're both in proximity, makes him sit down, awkwardly they get together, and they start talking. And that's when Lauren says, he pulls out this napkin, and he goes, look, the Lord, while I'm seeking the Lord, the Lord says, these seven my moles are culture, but I want to show you what it is. I'm hearing the story, and I'm going, this is so great. Why isn't, why isn't, I was up at uh, Wesley Campbell and Stacey Campbell's church up in Kelowna, British Columbia back then, and I was up there uh, with them, and, and, and as Lawrence talking, I'm thinking, why doesn't the body of Christ know about this? Why haven't I heard about this earlier? This seems to me to be a very important thing. And uh, he's going, and then, he, and then he says that he's meeting with, uh, and, and so, so Bill Bright uh, listens to Lauren, pulls a napkin out, and he's got these seven mimos, and then Bill Bright pulls a piece of paper out of his pocket. He's got the same seven different words. One called it church, the other called it religion. One called it academia, the other called it education. One called it politics, the other called it um, government. One called it arts, and another called it entertainment. One called it finance, the other called it business. But it was like a parallel universe. And the two of them said, what does this mean? Fundamentalist, charismatic, they're both hearing God at the same time. They both had youth movements. Campus Crusade for Christ, youth with a mission. The Lord was talking to saying something. This is the future. This is the promised land. Remember, there were seven nations greater and mightier than you. You think it's a coincidence that the Lord says there's seven nations when you're going to go into the promised land? So here's your promised land over here. God has a promise for you, and the promise is real estate, territory. He wants to occupy. And so the Jewish people, you know, they were told that this. So anyway, he's talking to me, and, uh, and I'm seeing this thing visually because I'm a visual learner. And I'm saying, I know what we got to do. It's mind molders and, and world kingdoms. They're abstract. It ends up being a laundry list. But this is too important a concept. So I'm seeing this thing as mountains. But I don't want to go into the whole story how I got this. But this is fascinating. I actually had a, well, I won't even go down. I'm just going to say I ended up with seven mountains. And uh, as I looked at that, I thought, wait a second, seven mountains. You see, because seven mountains, now you've got to catch this. It's important. Because we've, I think, made a mistake. And the mistake that we made was that we put everything, our ambition, our focus, our expectation, our anticipation, our theology into spirit and never saw that God's plan was to invade the natural. And so we put, so it kind of comes this way. I'll talk about this in a second because this goes right to Donald Trump, what's happening historically where America is and what's about to happen next in the next 30 days. So what we have is we have this, uh, and I did it because I was over here in the business mountain. And the business mountain, I was just, you know, I, I, uh, I actually went, I, I submitted my application to go to Philadelphia College of the Bible and they rejected me. Now there's nothing that feeds your psychology of self-worth more than being a Christian rejected from Bible college. <laughs> because the bar is so low, they just have to make sure you're not running from the law and you're not a child molester and I'll let you in anywhere. So I got rejected from Philadelphia College of the Bible. And, uh, but I was a businessman, a brilliant businessman, if I might say so, because I innovated multi-million dollar innovations for the oil industry, and uh, because I had a knack for, for, uh, for a certain kind of way of seeing the future, futurist, actually. And I could see where the trends were going, and I could figure out how to get a company position for where the future was, and the future wasn't in selling oil. The future was going to be in conservation. So I helped diversify companies into making these enormous profit centers. It was a lot of fun. But I wasn't alone in that. My dad was mentoring me, and he was brilliant. But... I was in Babylon, Long Island. Can you imagine every day going to work in Babylon? <laughs> and knowing how we are as Pentecostal prophetic people, we see significance in everything. Every day, I'm on my way to Babylon, once again out of the will of God. 
I was making a ton of money too, which uh, there was no gospel of prosperity back then, so I just felt guilty. And I'm selling my soul out to Babylon. Look at this, what a disgrace. Every day I'm in Babylon. Where's yet? I'm making these people money. I kept getting promoted. I kept saying, I want full-time ministry. I want a revival mantle like Charles Grandison Finney. I'd read Finney. I went to the Princeton Theological Seminary Library. I went, they thought I was a student. I finally realized how deceptive this was. They thought I was a student. I'm walking off with these original books and documents from the 1800s. I'm going home. This, I, and I thought later, I thought, I, I think that, I don't think I was supposed to do that. But I acted like I knew what I was doing. So I thought, oh. Anyway, so I'm in Babylon and uh, I'm getting so convicted. I had to leave Babylon because I kept reading, come out of her, my people. And I thought, this is so obvious, I'm out of the will of God. Can you imagine being that stupid that you actually lead your career based upon the anxiety that you're working in a place that has a bad name? So I, uh, I knew that I had to get out of Babylon, and I, but I also knew that I had to do ministry and revival. And the only way you could do ministry and revival uh, is to go find someone who's starting a church that's so desperate that they give you a job. So uh, I became the worship leader in the upper room. The upper room was a room over um, an auto body shop in Philadelphia, in the poor part of town. And uh, the guy, the auto body shop problem was, the guy would have the cars in the winter to warm things up. He would uh, turn the cars on so that all the guests would go up to the second floor. So while I'm leading worship, we, we would suddenly be uh, carbon monoxide invaded by all of that, which he was doing to keep his place warm downstairs. So we had to put in ceiling fans and open the window in our upper room. The problem was the room had low ceilings. And so tall worshipers were putting their fingers into the fans. <laughs> and we, ha we had to actually have ushers that would watch for the tall people and, and uh, seize them before their fingers went flip, 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 flip. And that, and my dad came down and checked the place out and he just rolled his eyes because he sees his son throwing away a career as a consultant in Long Island, New York, working with a Fortune 500 oil company on the New York Stock Exchange. I had a great career, making a thousand bucks a day, single guy, work as many days as I wanted to. I took the money, I felt God was, so I started consulting. I started consulting because this is what Jewish people do and they don't know what to do, they consult. <laughs> so I consulted, I was making money, I was funding this church, paying tithes for other people, helping other churches. I figured, you know what, I'm not a preacher. I'm not even good enough to get into Bible school, but I'm good enough at making money, so I'll go play a piano. I used to be a keyboard artist, so I, I'd do worship for the upper room, and uh, then uh, I'd fund churches, and I'd just do, do my own thing. And it was, it was a great calling, but, uh, and that was where I got exposed to deliverance ministry, because people, my, fortunately, my pastor was casting on demons all the time, and he got tired. He said, look, you gotta take some appointments. I go, what? He goes, oh, once the word gets out, you cast out devils, it, it's, you're open for business, everybody's got them. So, but I never had a great experience with these things. I always was embarrassed. I always start off like with, I never forget like this one guy, we had these big metal chairs. We didn't even have nice chairs like this. You had to really want to be in our meetings, to be in our meetings. You had to deal with the asphyxiation, the fingers getting wacky. But on top of that, we had the deliver speech, and, and so we would have delivered Frank Hammond. It was great. Derek Prince, Derek Prince, I studied all, all the greats. And uh, sounds like Trump, all the greats, all the best. We had the best. But remember we had these metal chairs. I'll never forget this one guy comes in. He has an anger issue. This is where I'm starting to learn anger issue. Well, I found out sometimes you don't have physical contact with people, sometimes you do. Probably one time you don't want to have physical contact with a person until they got an anger issue. These are the tips I'm giving you today in case you didn't know. You thought you were coming here to save America. I'm telling you how to save your butt from an embarrassing situation. So I'll never forget this, we got the whole room full of people and I'm the assistant pastor, their worship leader, working for nothing, I'm paying his salary, but it worked out. I'm casting out demons. And so, and so I'll never forget the guy, the guy went, I'm doing the whatever I was doing, and then commanding the spirit to come out and I had my hand on his head and he pushed my hand back. So I pushed back at him and I pushed my hand back. And next thing you know, I'm man he's manifesting that angry spirit and how I knew it was because 20 rows of metal chairs went flying back going <laughs> and he had his hands on my throat on the front. And I was laying under him going, I bind you in the name of Jesus, I bind you in the name of Jesus, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Choking me. But my pastor actually had an anointing for this. And he just comes up and is looking at me Chairs flying, everybody in the room's turning around, what's going on over there? It looks like an exciting deliverance session. And he just commands that spirit 
strip, takes authority over it and strips its strength out of its limbs. The guy collapses on top of me like 250 pounds. He says, all right, now go ahead and cast that spirit out. But it's like everything I ever did was never easy when it started. And after a while, you know, you, you develop uh, acumen with it. So I'm just telling you this because where you're going, you have not gone. And you have to have the humility to make mistakes. And you have to have the wisdom to recognize a mistake so that you don't repeat it. But where we're going, nobody's trained for it. So there's no, there's no school that takes you into Reformation America 2020. But God will use everything you've ever learned, like with David, take everything you ever learned. So after I, after, I, after I left Lauren Cunningham, he showed me the movie, his son did, he's crying in the back of the room, look at this beautiful movie. So his son was called into the arts and entertainment mountain. So his son's over here in the arts mountain, and he's, and he's over here, Lauren Cunningham is, you know, YWAM. So that would be, here's how I look at it. That's, that's the church mountain. This is the nonprofit world. And what I'm saying is the mistake we made was we have the uh, spirit world over here, and then we put the secular world over here. And so what happens is uh, we have uh, the sacred, which is, you know, the, like the Bible is over here, and then we have uh, salvation, which is over here, and then we have the next life, which is future. But what happens is we create an artificial disconnect from the world that's there. So, so what we've got is a spiritual life focus over here, but we neglect actually the, the secular world. We've got the next life, but we're missing this life. We're looking at uh, you know, what is inspired truth, but we're not translating it into its application in the world system so other people can understand in the language they speak. We got salvation for the soul, but we never thought about the salvation of a nation or a city. So what happens is we have what uh, Londa Cope calls the split gospel. The split gospel causes us to be only caring about, uh, where, it was this what I had, because this is how I could leave Babylon. This is how I could go full tilt boogie into uh, alignment with only one thing matters, and that's souls. Only one thing matters, that's the revival. One, only one thing matters, that's eternity. So what happened was I became, I became fully committed to that left side of the equation. But while I'm doing that, deliverance ministry, prophetic, doing other stuff, I'm realizing something's happening. I'm, I'm pastoring, I'm working, I'm meeting Lauren Cunningham, and God is saying that you're supposed to, uh, here was our theory, if we had a breakthrough in the church, and this was, remember, Toronto's going on, Rodney Howard Brown, we figured if we had a breakthrough in the church, we could take, you know, here's the family mountain over here, Here's education over there. Here's government and law over here. Here's media over here. Here's what both Lauren Cunningham and Bill Brake, the seven mind molders of culture. And the Lord showed to me as a vision, seven mountains. And he showed me that the kingdom is manifest and comes down into these seven mountains. And so the kingdom, thy kingdom come. I kept thinking it comes here and sucks everybody in like a giant Hoover vacuum cleaner. I figured if we have a move of God here, the city will come in, the mayor will get saved, and then this will happen, and then we're gonna, I just really, really thought that we were just gonna bore a hole through the heavens, take the strong man of the territory down, and revival is the answer. But you see, that, that creates a false dichotomy, because God is the God of seven mountains, not just one. He's not limited to just one. It's not like, well, we don't have an answer for other things, but we know how to do this. The Lord actually has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three generations of Jewish entrepreneurs. They weren't uh, rabbis. They were Jewish entrepreneurs with a prophetic gift that knew how to make money. That's the foundation of the Jewish nation. Does that make sense to you? Joshua was a general. He wasn't a rabbi. So what I'm saying is, this was my model. And then one day, I had fortunately, I had an apostolic leader come to me because I was very big on the prophets. Kim Clement, I was traveling with Kim Clement, Mark Sharona, and, uh, and, and uh, I mean, we just had Graham Cook was back there then. I love the prophetic, because the prophetic to me was like a window out of the box I kept putting myself into with my religious spirit, separating from the world, and getting so separated that I was finding myself not having an impact, it wasn't there. And so, as I'm there, this one apostolic leader comes to me and says, the Great Commission, Lance, is to go ye, and he realized my model was, come ye. I wanted all traffic coming into the revival center. And he was saying, go ye into all the systems. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. You have to get this, because this is where the body of Christ is almost sugar right now. Because the moment you talk about 
politics or government, we still don't get this. And what's worse is, I've preached this message in a lot of the, most, in a lot of the epicenters of revival, and they still don't get it. Because they keep coming back to the infatuation with supernatural signs, one is revival, end time, pouring, outpouring of God. They don't recognize the end game is to go into all the systems. We've got geography. Going into all the world, we thought was, and I've done it. My church had every flag of every nation, and we had a map in the back where every missionary we supported. Because our idea of going to all the nations was to get the gospel of Jesus Christ preached and churches planted in all these countries, then the end would come. Never occurred to me that uh, we have churches all over the place. You know what it really occurred to me is when I started going to the nations and realized that we had so many churches planted, like in the Caribbean, that they're all competing with each other. So if I went to this guy's church, I couldn't go to that guy's church. And I realized we got so many church plantings in some of these places. But then, I, then it occurred to me, what did Lauren Cunningham say about those seven? I was trying to integrate this thing. Wait a second. This could be one of the big ahas of my life. We're supposed to go into all the world because nations is what God's after. It's nations, it's the harvest of souls and the harvest of nations. The kingdom wants to come, but how does the kingdom come? I'll tell you what, if you don't have the right Christian on the Supreme Court, you'd be surprised how much mischief gets wrought in the discipling of a nation when you have laws that are framed by corrupt people who are restricting your liberty or taxing your money and taking your freedom away. In other words, each of these arenas here has a high place. Now I'm starting to get a map. Why do we have fights over presidential elections? Why do we have cities burning? What's the big cause as well? Let me tell you something. There's $2 trillion worth of money that's on the table with every election. And that's a lot of money, it's all jobs. There's two million jobs connected to who becomes president. Did you know that? Government is a big business. It's a profession, but race, by the way, solving race is not the priority. Creating a race issue that inspires donors to give you money is what most of the organizations are all about. I found that out when I saw pro-life people. See, we're very naive about this. I was, I was working with a candidate, a Christian, who was running for office, and what she, she was sabotaged by a pro-life group because she was getting support from one pro-life group that was out fundraising the other pro-life group, so they sabotaged and exposed that she had an abortion when she was young. This is Christians with Christians exposing a Christian candidate because she was cutting into the money that they were getting because, you know, even, I'm sorry to say, not everybody that is involved with Healing America or race issues or poverty is actually motivated to solve the problem. They make a living off of perpetuating it. So it's like, what the heck? So I realized that the full gospel is a split. The full gospel, actually the gospel of the kingdom is the spirit invading the secular, the sacred uh, and, and the supernatural going to the natural, the salvation of the soul going to the salvation of cities and nations and taking the power of the age to come and bring it into this age. That's Hebrews 6, 5. Take the power of the age to come and demonstrate it in this age. And the goal, we're all about souls, souls, souls. And I haven't talked to Bob Jones about this. He was so brilliant, but like he didn't get this. He was always educating me and correcting me, so it was only fair that I should point this out. <laughs> Constantly correcting me. And so I was like, all right. Well, I thought, one time I was preaching this message, he goes, well, I thought you were going to go up there and talk about Hebrews 5, 6 and Hebrews 6, 5. I hate to say it, but I may believe I knew what those verses were. I said, hmm. He said, you don't even know what those verses are, do you? I go, mm -mm, no. <laughs> well, it's about, it's about the ministry of Melchizedek in the end time, and it's about tasting the power of the age to come. I never forgot those two verses. But uh, the thing is, he would always talk about the end time outpouring as the harvest of souls. But I would suggest to you that it's almost like, I hate to say this, but I can almost go, if somebody's really a super progressive, I want to hear every point that they're passionate about. It's going to so be offensive to somebody here. I want to know every point because I've found that almost every point that somebody who is anti-Jesus, they're typically off on every point. So if they're really anti-Christ, then, I, then everything that I don't even know about, if this is what their position is, I explore it because typically the truth is on the other side. So I'm, so I'm trying to figure out how in the world is the church gonna make it from the uh, salvation of souls into nations 
Because like Bob is saying, a billion soul harvest, billion soul harvest. And that just locks people in on this. Because that's called the quantitative gospel. That's how many people can we get saved, and we don't know how to measure it. One friend of mine said that he was looking at Joel Osteen and, you know, Billy Graham Association, and at that time, Reinhard Bunke, and, uh, and, and then it was uh, Joyce Myers. He was looking at the statistics for all evangelical and all evangelism activity globally, and he came to the conclusion that the entire planet was saved twice already. Because <laughs> there's no metrics for this. But when Jesus says, go make disciples of nations, Oh, mamma mia, you can measure that because every election cycle tells you, every law tells you, every TV show tells you, that's a quantifiable metric. Qual qualitative, uh, that's a quanti you can actually see the quality of transformation. I'm convinced Christians don't like that, that level of accountability to a great extent. It's easier to be focused on the supernatural and the abstract than it is to measure your success. And what are we doing with the nations? I had a real aha moment when the... Uh, when I, when I was talking about Donald Trump, understand this, it's terrible to be a prophet with a message nobody wants. I really admire the prophets that are giving words of knowledge to people, standing them up and they're getting a healing, or this is your doctor, or this is the, show. oh, everybody's so excited, they're lining up for a prophecy. With me, I give words people don't want to hear. But I realize it's a very Jewish thing. So, so I got all my friends are working with Mike Huckabee, they're working with Ben Carson, they're working with Marco Rubio, they're, they're, they're working with Ted Cruz. Lord well, says to me, Donald Trump. I go, oh, he's the only guy that isn't a Christian. Don't you know, Lord, that that right away disqualified Christians aren't even interested in politics unless the guy's born again. They don't care if he's competent or incompetent as long as he's born again. So, uh, and the Lord says to me, he says, Isaiah 45 will be the next president of the United States, 45th president. Well, I knew that was either a deceiving spirit of the Lord because I didn't know the numbers of the president. I wasn't following it that closely. Understand, I, I'm hanging out with all my revival friends and I'm loving revival and I go in as the novelty act, Seven Mountains, Seven Mountains. I do my little Seven Mountain shtick and it's like, oh, that's very good. Then I go back with the revival. So I was really focused on this. And how I got out of pastoring was uh, because the United Nations called, business people called, corporations called. I'll never forget one guy at an apostolic network. He said, in your former life, before you went into uh, ministry, didn't you work with corporations and do like advising? Go, yeah, I did. And he said, well, we have a situation here with our apostolic network. We need some help with this. And, and it has to do with the, the leadership development process. They were in a, a stage of storming through their organization. And I said to him, I said, well, I used to do that. But uh, now I, I'm just with the word of God. <laughs> just revival evangelism and the word. i never forget the rebuke he gave me. It was so profound. He said, I'm not asking you to defile yourself. I'm asking you to help me. <laughs> so it's like Saul of Tarsus. You know, that guy could smell a religious spirit anywhere because he, wa because he had one. And I'll tell you what, I was in the deep end of the soaking pool for a long time. And I understand revival, I understand Pentecostal thinking, because I, I'm like the rich young ruler that left Babylon, I believe, in it so severely. And uh, when I got that Seven Mountain thing, and I started doing UN stuff, and I started doing the university stuff, and I started going, uh, they were starting thinking, and we had a great protest at Harvard, that was great, they didn't want me out there. Then I started, I hung around with some brilliant people, former economists, Milton Friedman had a team of people, I hung out with a Milton Friedman economist, smart Jewish rabbi, you should go watch any YouTubes of Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman could talk to you about economics with a smile, and educate you and tell you how stupid you are. <laughs> and you actually liked that. And so uh, I watched these videos, and so I had a, mel a, mentor, a mentor that uh, came from the Milton Friedman, worked with Milton Friedman, and he was also part of the resurgence of Christianity when Christians got involved in politics during the Reagan era. And he's the guy that discovered Christians were getting involved because he's going to the political you know, primaries and that stuff and people are coming in with Bibles. And he's freaking out, he's going, who are the people with Bibles? And he traced it back to Tim LaHaye and the Left Behind series and Christians that were worried about secular humanism getting into the you know, government, into the church, into, into education. And so he discovered there's a Christian movement. The guy ended up being Pat Robertson's campaign manager. His name's Mark Nuttall. And uh, so he's been my mentor on things political. And I feel like, oh my gosh, here's something you've got to know. And I appreciate your patience with me on all this. 
Each one of these verticals is a career. There's mastery, there's distinctions in each one of these. Like I'm saying about just deliverance, you think it's easy to cast out a devil? There's all kinds of nuances in a healing ministry and a renewal ministry and taking an offering. I'll never forget how embarrassing and mortifying it was when Kim Clement, I did a great tent event in Providence, Rhode Island, Kim Clement came, and it was a bit comical because, well, we had uh, the, you know, the women in the church that wanted to dance. You always have the dancers. We had them dancing and twirling and they, they loved to dance. And, and they, they weren't always in the greatest shape, but they were expressing themselves. And I was a pastor and just trying to love everybody. My wife's that way. My wife's uh, kind of like, she was really, she's great. She's an artist, film major. Uh, it's a perfect prophetic type because when she came into the kingdom, she was, she was a makeup artist and a tap dancer. So when the glory of God would fall, she'd go tapping across the platform. And we were kind of an eccentric couple, I imagine. But I'll never forget that we have these kind of out of shape people dancing with all twirling around for the prophetic conference. And unfortunately, with the great tent event, it wasn't a floor, it was, uh, it was, it was carpet put down over this. So we had all these rocks there, people are falling down all over the place, because it wasn't even, they're dancing and doing their exotic moves and falling. And Kim's staring at this and I'm smiling and saying, this is where Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, landed right here and made a covenant with the Indians. This is the place where he survived a winter after being kicked out of Massachusetts, landed right here and made a covenant with the Native Americans. This is why it's called Providence, because he saw the providence of God. I mean, I had this profound grasp of things, but not a very practical idea about how to do a tent meeting. And then he says, well, Lance, uh, you're good to take the offering. This guy was relying on God to pay his bills, and I know it's going to be expensive because he's got a whole music team. This is a well-known prophet. People are trying to get him all the time, but I got him because I'm a friend. Actually, I was on his board. That's how I get to know people. I'm on their board. I work as a Jewish consultant for people that I like. <laughs> so I was on his board. And in return, he had to do my meeting in Rhode Island, in Providence. Lance, you better take the offering. I got up. I took an offering. Now, I didn't know that there's actually even a science to taking an offering. What did I do? I said, hey, it's time for the offering. I don't wanna take any time away from the prophet tonight. I'm really anxious to hear him. We're all excited he's here. So as the Lord leads you, you have envelopes here. If you want an envelope, put your hand up. And so he's watching this horror show of an offering. <laughs> I sat down feeling that I did, without a doubt, a sincere, non-manipulated offering. And he leans over and says, that was the worst offering I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> now, I'm just getting to know the guy. I wasn't preaching that night. I had one job, introduce him and take an offering. And it was the worst one he ever heard. This is what I mean about you have to go into the unknown territory with a sincere heart and a willingness to screw things up. Because then I, listened, I said, well, why don't you take the next one? Because, you know, diversify here. Well, then I heard him take an offering. It was brilliant. And it was the biggest offering I ever saw my people give. It was there. I just wasn't doing it right. There's a science to everything. But in his case, he took time not to rush them. And then he told them what they were sowing into. Then he connected them with the anointing that was there and what God was doing so that they personally connected to the act other than supporting the event. They were connecting with the anointing that was flowing on the event that they'd seen every night manifest. And I analyzed it. I said, hey, V. How can I be so smart in business and so stupid in ministry? Because whatever vertical you're in, you can have mastery when you become dangerous is if you can master the science and specificity in more than one sphere. So the person that understands how government works, who also understands the supernatural, becomes especially dangerous. Providing you have, so I call this thing Seven Mountains, but now I've changed it since then because I, like, I never wrote a book. I only wrote a chapter for Che. The reality is I gave a chapter to Che because because I didn't want to write a book, Johnny. And like everyone else who heard the message was doing books. I said, who needs a book for me? And there's already books out there. But that chapter was a succinct summary, but I changed this and I said, you know what this is? This is actually 7M, then I trademarked it. I said 7M, because this is a heresy I can stand with. I'm just, whatever it comes out of this movement, I can own. I can't preach, I can't agree with everything people put seven mountains on, so I don't know what they're saying. What I come up with is the fact that the end time harvest is nations and that the harvest of nations leads to the harvest of souls. Why don't you catch this? That the harvest of nations is something the church is completely disconnected from because we got the spirit secular shift. We don't even think in terms of the nations or we don't even think in terms of America. So my friend uh, Mark Nuttall, who's the economist, and I'm talking to him and I'm saying based on the harvest of nations, 
Uh, he starts talking to me about there's 170 nations that don't have the ability to make it through the COVID cycle. There's going to be an economic reset. George Soros is initiating it with Charles Schwab, with a, with a guy named Schwab over in uh, Davos in Europe. That while, while, I'll never forget this. So I was writing my, my one book I wrote and then a second book I just got done. And I remember the Lord said, while men slept, an enemy came and planted. And the Lord told me the church needs an awakening. This is 2015. The church needs an awakening. The church needs an awakening because while they're sleeping, Satan is planting a harvest. And while men slept, this is what Jesus taught. Then they woke up. Where, where did the devil plant the harvest? Wherever there was a harvest for Jesus, the devil had planted a counterfeit harvest. He's got a movement wherever. So you take a look at every place where all hell's breaking loose, that's where heaven wants to visit. So I'm looking at that and I'm going, all right. These verticals, these spheres, each one of them has, has mastery. Whoever makes it to the top of these, you should be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. This is why, this is why the devil loves to oversimplify for charismatics and evangelicals a uh, spirit versus secular worldview. Where we don't get involved with politics, we just seek the Lord. I've been there, brother. You don't change a nation. By disconnecting from the nation, thinking you're going to somehow cosmically have a move of God and the law gets sucked into your vortex. It's delusional. The apostles didn't go from the upper room uh, to the upper room to the upper room to the upper room. They actually ended up going someplace else. And the gospel got to you because they went. So these spheres are now how you fulfill, go make disciples of nations. Go make disciples of nations. This is disciples of nations. Notice the language. It's not disciples in nations. That's what I thought it was. I thought, well, we have some people over here that, uh, look, we got a photograph. There's a missionary. There's a tent. There's going to be a building we're going to get. And there's the souls that are saved. That's done. And the Lord goes, wait a second. It's disciples of nations, not people in the nations. So when you really have an impact in your city, Raleigh, it's when you actually have believers that are here. Now catch this, this isn't that hard. Now no, I'll wrap this up and bring it home. The church here is supposed to go into all of these systems. An apostolic church will equip people with revival because you need a revival in you in order to go into here to do what? A reformation. You know what a reformation is? Most people don't know. We're confusing awakening, reformation, revival. It's one thing. It's reformation is top down. It's when you penetrate the high places. It's when your ideas have credibility to the extent that academia is being reshaped from the top down because power is in the gates and the gates are at the top of the mountains. So we got so many Christians that I know them. They're off, they're off in Bible school. They come back. They're seeking God. They want to have a ministry. They don't know the fact that Basically 10%, I found this out when I found that I was Jewish, only 10% of the tribes of Israel actually were, were set apart for ministry. 90% of them were called to go take territory. The promised land, these seven nations greater and mightier, I'm not saying these are the seven, I'm saying that the Israelites were sent in to nations that were greater and mightier than them. And I'm telling you, our movement now is not big enough to take any of these mountains without the supernatural help of God, but we at least have to agree with what God wants to do. Donald Trump comes along, Three times married, unsaved, celebrity with money. The Lord says, next president's going to be Isaiah 45. I didn't know what Isaiah 45 was. I go, actually, I'm sorry to say, I should have gone to the Bible first. I went to Google. <laughs> I went to Google. So I go to Google, and, and I go to Google for one reason. I'm trying to figure out which number is the next president. Because I can prove this is a deceiving spirit if the next president is not 45, <laughs> I gotta bind that spirit. I've had a deliverance anointing. I can tell when a demon, somebody was a supernatural voice talking to me. And I never heard the Lord talk like that before. So I go to Google, what number president is Barack Obama? 44. I said, aha, he was elected twice. That makes him the 44th and the 45th. And then I read on, however, whatever number you are when you go in, you stay with when you get there. So you're elected twice, you're still 44. Now I know. The next president's the 45th. I did not know that until the Lord told me. Uh-huh. Isaiah 45, now I go to Isaiah 45. I didn't know what it was. Open up, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, whom I've anointed. 
opening up the two lead gates of Babylon. You're going to cross over on a river. You're going to undo the belts of kings, which I'm looking at reading a translation, that which means you're going to undo the military capacity of your adversaries. It's like, oh my gosh. And then it goes, I'm going to do this for my people's sake, though, though you don't even know me, I'm doing it for them. Verily, Isaiah says, as he gets that prophecy, you're a God who hides himself. He hides himself in the person you don't think he's going to use in the move you're not looking for. Take that. Take that as a Jewish prophecy. He hides himself in the person you don't think in the move you're not looking for. So now I got thrice married Donald Trump on my brain and I'm loving him. I'm watching, it's like a train wreck. I'm watching, a, I'm starting to watch because the Lord's telling me, speak. I go, oh boy. Nobody wants this. Everywhere I go, somebody's on Cruz's committee, somebody's on Huckabee's committee. I'm meeting with people. Huckabee, I said, Donald Trump. Three times, but then I'm watching him. He's talking, he's just running from one disastrous statement to the next. But I'm watching him, and while he's saying these absurd, self-destructive things, I get hit with the strangest reflect, I don't know, it was a reflex. I was laughing. It, made, it was so nerve-wracking, it was entertainment. And I'm laughing. I'm going, oh, did you see what? I'm starting to text people. Did you hear the latest? But I'm enjoying it. Because in a weird way, my spirit man is leaping with joy while he's having these gaffes. He's saying stuff no politician can get away with saying. And they're predicting, he's done now. Amateur hour. He never should have said that. I don't forget it was Andrew Womack. This is the worst one. I'm trying to sleep. I'm, I'm Andrew Womack. I'm preaching uh, at his church, his Bible college. And I was exhausted. I go lay down on, on the bed. And I go, let me just check to see what Donald Trump's doing right now. And it's like, the Pope says, no Christian would ever have walls because uh, but when you have walls, that's not a Christian thing. It's talking about the southern border and Trump's position on walls. Next thing you know, Donald Trump comments on Pope. And I'm thinking any day he's going to self-destruct, but the Lord told me this guy's anointed. So I'm thinking, I don't someone who's anointed self-destruct. It's not easy unless he sins, but he's not sinning. He's just moving forward, doing what he does. And I read it. Donald Trump to the Pope. Who picks a fight with the Pope when you're trying to get elected? <laughs> Remember, he's sitting like that, and he's got his eyebrows sticking out like Scottish pipes. <laughs> I'm a Christian. It's like, you know. This is beautiful. Christians don't even have this kind of boldness. I'm a Christian and I'm proud of it. I don't want him telling me what Christians do. As far as I'm concerned, he's wrong. <laughs> His polls keep going up. Even the Catholics. Well, yeah, he has a point. <laughs> I remember those eyebrows sticking out like that. I mean, I'm sure I'm seriously thinking, like, when he, gets, when he gets really provoked, he gets those eyebrows sticking out. I start looking up his bloodline, Scottish, Scottish Reformation from the Hebridean Revival, his mother's side, his mother who gave him his Bible in 1955, married Fred Trump, she's a Christian, marries the heathen, and you know, she's praying for her husband, makes her son go to church, gives him his Bible, lectures him about God, little Donald taking it in, and uh, she's got her answer, part of the prayer team that brings in the Hebridean Revival, one of the last great moves of God we had after the Welsh Revival. It's in Trump's bloodline, he's a reformer. He's a reformer. Cuss is like a sailor, married three times. He's a reformer. <laughs> By the way, Martin Luther, the great reformer. Most of you don't know, you've got to get the original documents. I've got them. Read Darbinia's History of the Reformation. It's a book about that thick, fascinating. You'll find this guy, this, this guy, Martin Luther, he could be as crude and as crass as any German on a bad day you've ever heard. Hey, hey, the things he wrote, the things he said, it's all sanitized by the time you get it. You gotta read the original stuff. He had a temper too. God doesn't use people as sanitized as you think. That was when I figured out, oh my gosh, who is going to be Donald Trump's emissary into the church world? That you know God's got, you know God's making a statement. He could have picked Charles Stanley, he could have picked Franklin Graham, he picks Paula White. First of all, let me tell you something about men in ministry. They won't say this, but they really, there really is this, this culture, particularly in, in the Baptist circles and the old school where I'm at in Dallas in, in that area, where you, they don't really have, they're still debating with, whether women can be in ministry. You don't have big churches with women leading the mega churches. It's all men, and it's men on the staff, and it's men and elders, and occasionally they have a woman coming to minister, but basically they're still fighting that battle. 
You got Paula White, she's on her third marriage. Between her and Donald Trump, there's six marriages and you got the one heathen and that's who God anointed. I said, Lord, you, it doesn't make sense. I really believe right now, and you still have Christians, well, I can't vote for Trump because of his tweets, his dis personality, which is actually shallowness, really, because you're not even looking at what the guy does. Understand something. You may have a, you may have a guy who's flying that plane in the middle of a storm, who's cussing at the cabin crew, best pi fighter pilot from World War II. This, this guy knows how to, if there's a way to survive, he'll survive, he's telling you, sit down! He's yelling at people. So you don't really care, because what you're looking for is competency with an anointing to see you through. Or you could have the, you know, a freshman out of ORU who's praying in tongues but never flew a plane. <laughs> but is he a Christian? So when I go to meet Donald Trump, the first question, the first thing, first thing people ask me, is he a Christian? Does he, did he say the prayer? Is he a Christian? Did he say the prayer? This is like our code language for, you know, you get him to say, poor Donald Trump. I've had, I've had James Robeson, Maldonado, I've had at least three apostles and evangelists come up to me and say, I prayed with him. They, this guy said the sinner's prayer so many times. I think he thinks it's kind of like the Lord's Prayer for Pentecostals. We broke him in so severely. I mean, when he's around us, first me, first time he ever had hands laid on a poor guy. I mean, he's a, he's, first of all, he's a, kind of a germaphobe, which is kind of funny having to, because, you know, he doesn't like that. He has to learn how to get in touch with people. But uh, we're up there at Trump Towers, and right after we get done meeting with him, uh, Paul White convinced me. By the way, I love Paul, he's a friend of mine. But I'm just saying, think of the stumbling block, six marriages. And it's, can you understand why it was religious people with religious priorities, and re especially revival people. Revival people are as bad as fundamentalists because they don't want to be involved with politics in the first place. So they have to have some prof prophetically anointed, you know, dream as a candidate to even want to get involved with that place because they don't even think it's necessary. They think the revival is going to change government. You know, it doesn't work that way. You've got to go into the strong man's house. If you're gonna bind a strong man, you gotta go into the house. You gotta go in. Then you gotta be really good to make it to the top. Because competency and wisdom is what gets you on that ladder anyway. So Donald Trump has all these people laying hands on him. Never forget that. You know, oh boy, everybody's laying hands on him. Here's a guy who doesn't like to be touched. Everybody's got their hands on him. Next minute, they all got their hands. He's getting used to it. He actually thinks that's how you're supposed to pray. Laying on a hands. He's, he's been broken in by Pentecostals. First prayer breakfast, national prayer breakfast, my favorite story. I'm out there in Washington. He's now president. And, uh, and, and, and so he's president, and, I, and I'm watching this thing. I'm in the audience. And, they, and of course, I've been doing this for years with Doug Coe, which is brilliant. They got the great stealth. Doug, and by the way, uh, Ann and Butler are here. So, Barnett, good to see you guys. So I'm there, I'm there with uh, the, the prayer breakfast folks and uh, Donald Trump's first prayer breakfast. Understand he's trained by Pentecostals now. So they come out there and they do their typical <clears throat> water routine. They got two, 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 two sides, like two Senate guys, one Democrat, one Republican. We have a tradition of coming together here once a year in a bipartisan community lifting up the name of Jesus. And the other guy goes, and in that tradition, we even meet together on the hill once a week for our Bible study. It's kind of like, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like a Quaalude experience, actually, if you're Pentecostal. <laughs> so it's like, I think if Mike Lindell could get this soundtrack with his pillow. <laughs> so they're going like that. And then, then he says this, he goes, then they go, all right, so now let us pray for the president. Now since Dwight Eisenhower, from the beginning, this is where you all, in good Presbyterian fashion, bow your head. Donald Trump here is, now let's pray for the president. He's sitting all the way over there. He realized these people are really bad at staging things. He's a professional in media. So he gets up, he gets up, he does the inexcusable. He gets up and he goes walking across the stage. Now they're worried about assassinations. They got 900 foreigners there. They're off, all of a sudden, poof, bring up all over the place. Every secret service agent who was embedded in the crowd is up with their finger there. Where's he going, where's he going, where's he going? Eagles moving, eagles moving, eagles moving, eagles moving. And so Donald Trump floundered over. And these two guys, as I said, they're shocked because this is, the, this is a certain a protocol. They've done this for years. And they're not, you're not supposed to do anything when you pray. Trump stands between the two of them.
When he hears, we're going to pray for the president. He's not looking for one of them Presbyterian moments. He expects laying on of hands. So he's standing there. Okay, guys, come on. You know, you guys in politics don't understand showmanship at all. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Do your thing. And they're like this, because the Secret Service is, don't you touch him. Don't, don't, don't touch him. And they're like, they don't want to touch him. They don't want to get shot. So they're like, and the president's going, okay, guys, let's go. So the audience starts coaching. This is the charismatics out there. They're embedded at the tables also. Put your hands up. We're going, put your, I'm there. I'm going, put your, put. And. And they slowly. And they got physical contact. Trump nods. Okay, good, go on, let's go. And they nervously prayed their presidential prayer. Nothing like he's used to. And you can tell right then he's gone, these guys are amateurs. He's thinking, they don't know. Not like Paula and the other ones. They know how to pray. These guys in DC, they don't do anything right in DC. Let's see. Now this wasn't the most persuasive presentation I should have given you if I was trying to persuade you why Donald Trump is anointed of God. I'm just telling you right now, there's a move of God happening in the United States and God sent somebody and he sent somebody that's offensive to the religious spirit. And I want to tell you something. The people that have a problem with Trump have a problem with a religious spirit. That's my opinion. Not the opinion of anyone else. That's my opinion. You got 300 of these knuckleheads are rented by George Soros, funded by Open Society. They're actually taking money from the left in order to become a mobilized entity to come against Donald Trump to bring further confusion to Christians. What Trump has done, and I never feel like there's an anointing on this, but I think most people aren't like me. I think they actually process information, and they're probably smarter than me, so let me tell you this. He's the most pro-life president we've ever had in history. The only guy that actually marched with pro-life and then showed up and spoke. <laughs> to Che's point about the race for life, this is the one guy that actually will do it for you. He brought the Arab, or Arab Emirates to the table. He's got three nominations for a Nobel Peace Prize because there's not been any wars in the Middle East. None, since he's been there. Soleimani, actually, you guys, people don't realize this, but Soleimani was actually staging with our $102 billion that we, he got from, uh, from us previously. He was staging a coup in Iraq to kick us out, to attack our embassy, to burn us down and humiliate us in order to raise up the caliphate with Iran at the top of it and to instigate instability in the Middle East. Wrong time to do it with Donald Trump because Donald Trump is actually anointed to undo the belts of his adversaries. There has not been, I'll never forget, when President Xi comes to the United States, because what people don't realize, that China has an $11 trillion GDP, Trump has a $21 trillion GDP. He knows he's twice as big as China is. He also knows China's growing at 7% a year, we're at 2%, 1% but when he gets in. Trump's gonna reverse that. America holds all the cards and Trump knows how to play the hand that was given to him. And he lets China know things are changing. And so the strange thing is China would never, the Communist Party would never condescend to come to a billionaire's hotel. Do you understand what a gag reflex that is for a true Marxist to come to an American enterprise to meet with him? It was a humble, that's what I learned from Mark Nuttall, it was a humbling moment, but he had to come because at that point, China, China's economy, massive, powerful, and built like a house of cards because they have no internal controls over it. It's a command economy. But for the fact that the United States and the world consumes everything, they'd flat, they, they couldn't be a threat because they don't actually run on market physics or dynamics. It's just they carry their own currency, pegged to nothing, and nobody can look at their books. Trump knows that. President Xi comes out to meet with Donald Trump. I'm on a prayer call with Washington people. I'll never forget this. Praying for the president. All right, we're going to pray for the president. Pray for the president. While we're praying for the president, President Xi is there at Mar-a-Lago, of all things, meeting with Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump is now looking at sarin gas that was used with children and civilians whose faces are swollen, whose tongues are sticking out, who have white foam in their mouth. He is flippant furious. He's a Queens developer. He's actually never been hardened and indifferent to the pictures the CIA shows, the political people. You look at this, oh, look at this is terrible, terrible. He's not used to seeing that. He pulls Xi aside. He says, look at this. This is what's happened in Syria. Now remember, Xi is trying to measure this guy. He's, he's, he's studying who is his adversary. Trump goes, look at that. 
You'd do something, wouldn't you? The president, she goes, yeah, sure. He goes, I'm going to do something. I'm going to deal with it. I don't mean to be rude. I'm going to have to leave you. I've got to take care of this. I'll be back. We have a beautiful chocolate cake. You're going to love it. That's what he says to me. Beautiful chocolate cake. When I get back, I want to talk to you about North Korea because I don't understand this at all. I'll be back. He goes off. I'm on the phone. 42 missiles go into Syria. This is like he's just gotten in office. He's already sending missiles to go bomb things. And uh, freaks out the entire Middle East because now they know he really could be crazy. <laughs> but he's not. There's kind of like a righteous indignation when he saw the sarin gas and had sufficient intelligence that this was used on civilian targets and that no president has ever had the chutzpah to do anything. He said, uh, what's the risk factor? You gotta get Russia out. Call Russia, tell them to get the heck out of there. I don't want any, I don't want any collateral damage. I want precision strikes. I want to send a message, 42 Tomahawk missiles now. Yeah. He does his little announcement, goes back, discusses, I just dropped 42 missiles on him. We gotta do something, right? Yeah. Okay. Got it. The chocolate cake. Look at this. And then they bring the chocolate cake. You couldn't write this stuff. This is stories people don't ever know about. Because the media is so incensed against them, they'll never tell you a story like this. Then he says to them, what's the deal with North Korea anyway? I can't figure this out. I mean, I'm told you have influence there. This is crazy. Dumb like a fox. You see, he's got all these brilliant, high-paid consultants all around the John Kerry class that have never been able to, comp to solve a single problem and only get us in wars we shouldn't be in. Trump doesn't trust him. He said, I've seen these people my whole life. Hi, Mia. He says, I'm doing deals all the time, and other people are doing the consultants. Consultants never do deals. I do deals. So he doesn't trust the guy, because they say that you've got to go to these people. He's suspicious. So what, ha what happens is, this goes to summarize this. The, after the 42 missiles go, he turns to G. And here's if you really want to persuade somebody. You go to them, and you literally make them part of the solution. You go to the big developer, and you work out the deal between the two of you. You don't go with your little team here and how to beat that guy. You actually go to him, and you fix. So what Trump did is ingenious. He goes to she, and he looks like a novice, because he is. But nobody is, Trump is, he'll, he'll listen to anybody's theory on anything, but he makes his own decisions. So he's very secure that way. He's not actually looking for advice because he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's just checking to see if there's an error in his judgment. So Chi sits down with a napkin and draws a map and explains the complexity of the situation for him. What's happening for him is he's realizing he has some leverage with this wild president. As long as they're getting along, he actually can be part of the solution to the problem, and Trump is under his end. So he's going back saying, I got leverage with this guy. But Trump's given the guy leverage with him because he wants him to explain to him his perception of what the problem is. Then you remember when Trump says, you know, I got a button, you got a button, my button's bigger and it works. <laughs> the only reason why Kim Jong-un backed down is because China said, we're not playing chicken with this guy. I already had dinner with him at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> Before the chocolate cake comes, he could do something. He took out Soleimani, the number one, nobody could touch this guy. Impossible, you dare not do this. You dare not, because the head of state. He's a terrorist head of state. This is the guy that was actually putting devices on the roads that Americans were getting blown up on. So all the, all the guys that were coming home without legs, without arms, these were the devices that this Iranian mastermind had developed to blow up, and he gets killed by a drone on the same road while he's masterminding an attack to embarrass Trump. Big boo-boo. Trump says, take him out. He's done. He put 200 many Christian judges there who are actually going to be their firewall defending Christian liberty. Uh, in, in, in 200 judges. Imagine, imagine the, the judicial is, is a tyranny right now if it's in the wrong hands. He's the most transformative prison reform guy that we've ever had. He did what Democrats never did. His whole thing about the uh, First Step Act has 1,800 first-time offenders who were locked up for two decades. He got them out. 1,800 people who are in good... I mean, the guards say they're good. Or they got born again in prison. And it's like, these, these cats are okay. They're, and so they don't need to be there. He did it. It wasn't the left that did it. Trump did it. And nobody hears about it. He took, uh, 
he took the right to try out. People that are dying all over the place. I mean, if your kid's dying, if you're dying and you need an experimental drug, you can't do it because the bureaucrats are locking it up. And you're going to Mexico or some other country to try to find a cure. Trump said, no, if you want to take the risk, we're going to fix it so you waive the, uh, uh, waive the liability issue and experiment. Because out of those experiments, we accelerate our breakthroughs on these drugs. So uh, then he goes along, this guy, this is what he's doing while he's getting impeached and while he's dealing with Russia collusion and while the Republicans are, are half listening for the evidence on Russia. I mean, amazing what the guy does under siege. Yeah. Then he begins, he gives paid family leave. Women don't know this, but he's the first guy that said, you know what, we need families. America needs families. I don't know what this anti-family thing with abortion and everybody else, we need women to get pregnant and have children. So therefore, uh, we want paid family leave. So he arranged for eight weeks for you to be able to have paid family leave so you could actually keep your job and have the baby. That's, that's what he did. Nobody talks about it. He goes to the uh, World Trade Organization, goes to the UN, he goes to the EU World Court, he goes all over the globe where all the American globalists all sign off on all these things. He says, the heck with that. If it doesn't work for America, we're not footing the bill and we're not doing it. He suddenly is the champion of America's sovereignty. And then he, then, he, then he gives us the greatest economic recovery we ever had in history until China created the virus. This is a China bio lab virus. And the prophetic in me, nobody, and nobody really sees this. I see it, I feel like a fanatic talking about it, but what we're dealing with is in American politics. What happens in America certainly affects America in the same way that not listening to the Apostle Paul when you are you know, the centurion and pilot of a ship, sir, as I perceive, there's disaster ahead if we make a wrong choice. We're actually the prophets saying there's a disaster if America makes the wrong choice. Trump said it. He let it slip at a Tulsa rally, first rally. He says, look, we're on our way back for economic recovery. The most important thing is that America doesn't have a Great Depression. We could deal with our differences, but we got to keep the economy because things really get bad when you have a Great Depression. And he said, providing we don't do something stupid in November, we'll be fine. We're going to, the economic recovery is here, and America will be back on track. He said, but, and if not, and he's very prophetic. He said, and if not, meaning if uh, he doesn't get reelected, he says, well, maybe there'll be a backlash, and the backlash will come later. And who knows? Maybe not. We'll see. The moment he said that, I realized that we, who are already persuaded, couldn't be any more persuaded. The non-persuaded are not exposed to people like us. This is the danger of being in the secular spirit bubbles and separating ourselves from the world is the fact that the people that need to be influenced aren't hearing me. They already left the building. They already left. I said goodbye to some of them. Because if you're not already in a relationship with people, they're not gonna hang around and listen to what you gotta say. So we have a real challenge right now, and that's gonna be what's the future is gonna be like for America. And I'll say this, the final, the final thing I wanna tell you is, Donald Trump goes to the UN, most people miss this. He goes to the UN and has the first religious liberty conference. They're all doing global warming. Global warming, global warming, that's like the new religion, global warming. And so uh, he goes and says, forget global warming. He said, I just found something out. 80% of Christians in the world are in nations that actually persecute religious liberty. He said, I made Pompeo go check it out. I made Pence go check it out. But it's a fact. He's calling out 130 nations and their leaders right there for the persecution of Christians, Jews, and religious minorities in their country. And he's saying that's going to stop. He's literally challenging the global order on the, on the persecution of Christians. And he's not doing it. Uh, because in order to court evangelicals, because he's already got the evangelicals. He's doing it because it's a personal offense to him that there's that much abuse going on to Christians. And he talked about how many are being martyred. He said, I'm reading this, 8,000 like, you know, uh, a month, 8,000 a week or something, he's got some ghastly number. He said, can you believe that? He's looking up at these guys, can you believe this? I didn't believe it. This, he's talking to them like a modern day Cyrus is what I'm saying. Cyrus in the Bible, Isaiah 45. And here's what I'm gonna tell you. We're in a moment now in American history where China released that virus. It got permission because the prophet in me, Daniel, the prophetic in me says there's a principality, rose up in China, it's a spirit. It's the next dominant world order and it will, it will be the beast system. When that, thing when that thing gets merges with Silicon Valley and you have a digital global economic system with the Soros's and the, and the Davos, trust me, America goes wrong, we're no longer at the head of the table dictating the world order. We're trying to play catch up in a depression. So this dragon was allowed to release that. And they've war gamed this stuff, so they know how long it takes for this stuff to get to the United States and, how, and what will it do to quarantine an economy. This has already been worked out in war games because that's what the World Health Organization does. It anticipates the impact of plagues. 
So they already played the scenario. China knew what it was. They released the virus. Now, let's say that it was an accident. I think it was an accident. I think they're screwing around with bioweapons, which is goofy, but it's like this. That's the way they're thinking. And the thing got out of the lab. So it's kind of like aliens. You know, the thing's loosening the ship. And then it starts going. Because if they really wanted to do it, I wouldn't have started in Wuhan. I would have put it in Brazil or someplace else. So I don't think it was intentional, but they shouldn't have been fooling around with manipulated, biogenetically disease uh, weapons that they can have the cure for. How insidious is that? They were gonna create the weapon, so if they use it, they have the cure and you don't. So they could basically control the world. It's like a scary stuff goes on these people's heads. So that virus goes out, and I honestly believe it when, the, when America got paralyzed, and then the George Floyd incident happened, but I know how the politics of this, I know how the optics of this, I know how race in America actually works, both its tragedy side and its political payoff side. And, and you gotta know how both those sides work. So I'm looking at that, I'm seeing America paralyzed, I'm seeing, then I see Antifa rising up, I see statues coming down, I see the protests, I see Seattle, and I'm looking at the Marxist insurgency. And I'm watching all this stuff, and it's one thing after another. And while I'm watching, I'm saying, Lord, is this like judgment on America? But why would you do that while Cyrus is in office? Is this the beginning of the end for America? I just said, I don't know what you're doing. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to pray that the church wakens, because the church is the, is the, is the one that can change this dynamic. So as, this, as I'm praying that, I realize when Cyrus was in office, he released the remnant to go rebuild the temple. The remnant went to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They were in Babylon at the time. They did good for two years, then they got distracted. They were all looking at their own prosperity. They had so much peace and prosperity that they quit building God's project, which was his house for the nation, and they went to building their own projects. And so God sent a plague that arrested their economy and then sent a prophetic word to them saying, you don't understand timing and you don't understand what's happening. I'm judging you because you're not doing what I put you here to do and you're playing games with the clock and I'm controlling it. This people says it's not time. Prophet said, you don't understand timing. You're in a window of grace right now. God gave you a season, a window to repent. So you hear the repentance message and everybody's talking about what to repent for. I'm gonna tell you, in my opinion, church has to repent of its apathy regarding standing for the reformation and the restoration of America. Because we got a top-down capacity right now. Grassroots revival is bottom up. Revival bottom up, reformation top down. We keep pushing revival because I think we got this, if the church has a breakthrough, everything will change. No. Church has a breakthrough, you have an upper room, go. Then we gotta scatter and go into those institutions because that's where the reformation happens. If you don't win that battle, what did Jesus say? Okay, sweep that house clean, bind the strong man, sweep it clean, have a move of God. And then what did Jesus say? You don't occupy it, it'll be seven times worse when your revival's over. You wanna talk about a backlash. You go ahead and take the money out of the globalist hands like Trump is doing, look at the backlash he's getting. He, you media, I mean, we, I mean, we got a target on us just because we're middle class irritating but you actually become a force that actually challenges the elites, they'll take you out. So we're in an interesting season of spiritual warfare right now. And my word to you is this, at this moment, 2020, as China released that virus, when it got to the president's body and he went to the hospital, he lost one of his best friends, a developer, died in four days. I knew he had fear, he wouldn't tell anybody this because he's always, he's actually a very soft guy, but he acts tough because it has to be his, his act. So he was, he, was, he was concerned. He also knows America can't live in fear the economy goes down and the nation loses its power to protect itself. So he's got a balancing act. But when he went in, the Lord, I believe, spoke to me. And I haven't heard the Lord say much. It gets embarrassing because people keep saying, what's the Lord doing? Well, it's like, Lord, if you don't tell me something, I got nothing to tell him. But when he was in that office, I was praying with my wife, Annabelle, and it sometimes happens. You could prophesy out of your spirit um, and you'll educate your head. And so sometimes I say stuff and it's like, oh, that was the Lord. I go write it down because I didn't know that until it came out of my mouth. And I was praying with her for the president and the Lord had me pray that the, that the pit that they have dug, they will fall into themselves. I thought, that's hardly a healing prayer. But then when I got done, I realized that principality sought to kill Donald Trump. It wants to kill your nation. It wants to kill your future. It wants to kill your economy. It wants to kill your kids. That's, it's a vicious spirit. You're dealing with a real principality. But when it reached his body, it overreached. And I can't tell you how this works exactly in the spirit, 
But I remember when Stephen died and he called upon the name of the Lord, Saul of Tarsus was there consenting to his death. And I remember one man of God say, I can't explain it when you see tragedies happen. There are times when God is playing chess and he let, and the devil does what the devil does. And then the Lord goes, that one's going to cost you. Because you didn't see what that just triggered in my system. It's like, uh, we're, and it's not, it's Marcus of Queensbury. I don't, I'm not cheating. You just set something up you didn't know. I honestly think when that spirit reached in to take his life, the Lord said, that's touching my anointed. It's one thing if America's too stupid to defend itself and it has the power to make a choice like everybody on board a ship with Paul going to Rome. And he says, sirs, I would advise you, don't do that. You're going to lose, we're going to lose our lives and all the cargo. Well, they took a vote and decided they're going to go anyway. And they got caught in a storm. They lost almost everything. Apostle Paul had to bail them out in a shipwreck on Malta. So there's, you know, but it won't be a foreign nation that takes us out. It'll be death by suicide. It's like Lincoln said, we're so situated geographically that no other nation actually can take us out. We'll have to kill ourselves. So here the church now has the ability to shift the battle in America. 30 million Christians are not voting, confused on voting, aren't sure what they're going to do because they're not exposed to people that are clear leaders. Leaders themselves, including pastors for the most part don't want to get involved with offending people or losing, losing market shares. So they're kind of ambiguous about these things. But I'm telling you right now, I apologize for going over, but I didn't come out here actually to keep a schedule. I came out here to start something. Amen. You guys are going to have to become, just like with COVID, they got super spreaders. You need to be Holy Ghost super spreaders. And you need to recognize that God is moving now differently. So the Lord said to me that now the pit they dug. So I believe that Donald Trump, in spite of the polls saying he's not going to win, I believe that what's happened is a shift in the battle in the heavenlies has happened, which is why I'm going to the mall in D.C. four days for the election. And I believe there's an angelic alignment happening. I also, I know, I know a lot of people don't get the Israel thing. I'm just going to tell you this. You know how I knew we weren't winning the world? In spite of all our evangelism and all that stuff? I knew it when Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and he triggered a vote in the UN. And I saw something like uh, seven nations would recognize Israel's right to have its capital in Jerusalem. 160 other nations against it. There's our Christian influence in the world. And nations where we have our strongest churches didn't vote for the Jewish people. Now, when Jesus comes back, there's only one issue, sheep nations and goat nations. I encourage you to get this revelation now because this is, this is like God's opening it up to us. It wasn't relevant five years ago. I talk with Mike Bick, a lot of people, they're saying, well, I don't believe it's sheep nations. Their definition of a sheep nation is so high that they're thinking the millennium. I'm saying, no, the minimum for a sheep nation, as much as you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done to me. Why am I putting my hand like this? Because my brethren doesn't refer to, as we've taught social gospel, the poor, the prisoner, the underfed, and the child. It's, it's great offering for, your, for your, my wife's ministry, which is furnishing families. As much as you've done to the least of these, you, you've done to me. He isn't talking about the poor and the sick and the disenfranchised, although that would be a good theological point. He's talking about how the nations persecute his people. Amen. And so stretching his hand to his disciples, Jesus said, who is my mother, who is my brother? Those that hear the word of God and keep it. He stretched his hand to his disciples. So the world is going to be persecuting Christians and they will be mobilized against Israel, just like we saw the UN vote. Nations will be driven to the value decision, they'll be making a decision about Jews as they do with a Jew, they will do with a Christian. I watched the whole world vote against us. Only the Jews taking a hit right now. And I looked at that and I said, thank God Trump decided to do it. He said he had nothing but phone calls. When he made the decision, but sir, don't do it. All over the world, world wars, it'll be war, there'll be war, there'll be war. Trump, his gut, see, he's prophetic. He said, thank you, I'll call you, I'll call you. He called, you know when he called him? He called him after he made the decision. <laughs> there was no war. It was so embarrassing. They had to have a specially funded uprising take place. Left-wing funded American uprising because they were so humiliated that there was no spontaneous outrage. And so they had to fund something. But you know, ever notice, instead of it being like the day it happened, it's like, you know, a week later, oh, oh, oh Palestinians are upset. Well, it took them a while to get organized. So the reality is where you are right now is God is willing to give us four more years, but it's not for America. Selfish as we are, it's for the emerging sheep nations. So Donald Trump said something at that UN meeting, which my Jewish prophetic ears picked up on. 
Unfortunately, his, 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 his rebuke of the UN for persecution was lost because that was the day the Democrats decided to launch impeachment. So the news cycle was about impeachment instead of Trump rebuking the UN for persecuting Christians and Jews. Anyway, he said something at that meeting. He said, I'm starting a new organization which is going to be for the global unifying of the people of God, meaning Christians, in every nation that wants to participate as a firewall organization to deal with religious persecution, and we will deal with it from the State Department. It will be part of our economic policy, how they treat God's people. That's what he's telling us. I would have thought Christians would have caught it. Nobody caught it. Everywhere I go, nobody ever heard of it. But I got the manuscript. I just went and I literally brought my computer up here just to double check. Yes, is what he said. Mike Pompeo is a Christian. Mike Pence is a Christian. There's 300% more Christians in high places in the government mountain right now than in any period of history in America. 300%. More Christians surrounding this office. While Christians are twiddling their thumbs and complaining about tweets, we have the world is literally in the balance. And I think God is going to cause China a setback for trying to take out the president. Not China, CCP, they're like freaking out over this one. It's the principality. And Trump has a personal issue with that spirit now. And he says, I'm gonna deal with it. You want that for the next 36 to 48 months, my friend? But trust me, if a miracle happens, and it will have to be a miracle, if a miracle happens and God does intervene, it'll be because his standing with Israel released a supernatural grace upon him for the continuation of mercy rather than judgment on America. And God will do it to set back China and the, uh, and the, uh, the Davos agenda for a global economic reset in January, it's coming up. And uh, it's, I believe that all this tension's been good because the body of Christ has been forced out of its complacency and it's flushed out the political spirit that doesn't want to engage in controversy because it doesn't want to engage in controversy. And I believe now we're gonna see a reformation potentially like we've never seen. Fair enough? All right, thank you. There's a... Uh, there's a guy back there named Tom Cacadellis. Tom, are you still here? Yes, sir. Field rep for uh, Family Research Council. Best weapon tool in your arsenal is we're all ignorant of candidates. Drop He's, the foyer, Larry. What's that? Drop the foyer. You're in the foyer. I want everyone here to pick up the voter's guide. Yeah. This is very simple. It's who's running and what kind of values and spirits do they want to unleash in America? And so you ought to see that. And remember, uh, this county here is a critical county. This area is critical. Every vote not only counts, but every vote is a spiritual act. That means that you're either planting the seed in agreement with God, or you're planting it in agreement with the devil. But you're tied to the harvest of complacency if you don't vote, you're tied to the harvest of righteousness. Whether you win or lose, you've made your faith position known for you and your house. And there's a consequence to this. So I'm gonna tell you that it, for Christians, they don't even vote sometimes if they don't think there's gonna make a difference. It doesn't matter if it makes a difference. It's a spiritual act. I'll see you in DC, hopefully. Go to, by the way, write this down because I didn't promote it. It's, uh, it's uh, asonerally2020.com as one rally 2020.com because if you're not there, you can at least be zooming in and join about, uh, we don't know how many, but we're gonna be making one great effort prophetically in Washington for the breakthrough.